What's up, Freaks? It's your boy Marty here to introduce us rip of TFTC. Thank you for joining us. Give this video a like. Subscribe to the channel. If you catch us on podcast apps, make sure you subscribe there. Give us a rating, a review. Go to tftc.io as well. Become a member of the site. Join the conversation. Truth for the commoner. Trying to get you the high signal content in a world gone mad. This rip was brought to you by good friends at River. River's here to make it as easy as possible for you to buy Bitcoin and then take it into self-custody. Go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today, uh, and you'll get $5 of Bitcoin after you buy $100 worth of Bitcoin on River. You can dollar cost average into Bitcoin with no fees. Uh, if you're just buying one off, River has the best fees in the industry. Uh, they back all their Bitcoin reserves one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage. Uh, they highly recommend that you take self-custody. They just introduced limits. So if you want to set a limit order uh, below or above the current Bitcoin price, River makes that extremely easy as well. They also have real customer support. You can pick up the phone and call them if you have any questions about your experience on River. So go to river.com slash TFTC, set up an account today. This trip is also brought to you by our good friends at CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is here to provide you with a new way to pay for your health care. It's not health insurance. Health insurance is notoriously expensive, opaque, impersonal. CrowdHealth is really trying to change that model. You pay a monthly fee. It builds up in an account. If you ever have a health event, you let CrowdHealth know. They go to the doctor. They negotiate the price lower. You pay the first $500 and the rest gets crowdfunded by the CrowdHealth community. They have Bitcoin lightning payments that they just enabled. So if you want to pay your monthly fee plus your doctor in Bitcoin over the lightning network, you can now do that. Uh, they've got a roster of doctors that you can access. Uh, they're approaching healthcare in the right way. It's a healthy community focused on preventative healthcare uh, and avoiding the big pharma industry as much as possible. So if you're looking for a cheap healthcare solution, you're not happy with your health insurance, maybe it's a bit too expensive. Try out CrowdHealth. Me and my family use it. Go to joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. Sign up today using that and you'll get $50 off your first month. Joincrowdhealth.com slash TFTC. Enjoy this rip. Mark Whitney, it's great to have you. Hey, Marty. Great to be here, as always. We're in that. that What's up, Marty? What's up, Whitney? Happy to be here. We're, We're in that period between Christmas and New Year's where... I'm terribly exhausted. We have two <laughs> young kids around Christmas. And uh, me too, dude. It's all good. We'll yeah. be exhausted together talking about, uh, you know, banks up to no good as they tend to be. I mean, that's a good jumping off point. You guys just wrote an incredible <laughs> article <laughs> expanding on something we discussed <laughs> a year ago, Whitney, which was the Farmington uh, FTX deal. Uh, well, did they change the name to Moon Bank or something like that? Moonstone. Moonstone. Uh, you left the end of that piece, that conversation, alluding to this weird company, Fluent, and you and Mark just co-wrote a piece that really ties back Farmington and Moonstone and paints the picture of the technical architecture of what could eventually become the CBDCs, and it revolves around stable coins, which Mark, I know, You've been on a pretty big vendetta on Twitter against David Coyne. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I I just think that there's a there's a huge push to sort of, you know, to, to dollarize the world, right? I mean, that, that's what we've learned from the dollar system over all these years, especially you know post gold standard, you know, window shutting. It's like you know how do we how do we get increase the velocity of the dollar and increase the reach of it as much as possible? And now we have this tech that. Uh, you know, does that better than ever. Um, and uh, we're seeing, you know, we're about to see trillions of dollars go into the stablecoin, you know, uh, ecosystem for sure. When you begin to kind of pick at it and look at the players, you know, you see spook banks like uh, like Farmington and Moonstone. And, you know, uh, obviously a huge part of the FTX debacle was stablecoin related. So, yeah, it gets very fun. There's a lot of uh, fun things to talk about with stablecoins for sure. Yeah, and I guess to start, I mean, I don't have the piece open right in front of me, but I think going back to Farmington Moonstone and how Fluence involved uh, is probably a good 
jumping off point to basically connect the dots from the last time. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, you know, Farmington came under the control of, you know, basically the Dell Tech crowd, like John Chalopin, who's chairman of, uh, chairman of Dell Tech. Uh, Dell Tech being a major bank for FTX and also Tether, right? And so he, along with people like Noah Perlman, who I also wrote about recently, who's now the chief compliance officer at Binance and was previously COO of uh, Gemini, um, was with him or, or is like on the board of the vehicle that was used to purchase and bring this tiny bank under control. So for people that like may not remember why it seemed sus that like this group wanted to take over this particular bank. They're like super small. It's like a broom closet sized one branch bank in the middle of nowhere in like rural Washington state that like for like a, over a hundred years had just been like this local bank for like local, local agriculture and like ranching and stuff uh, and had like n never really had any more than like $10 million in deposits. And then Shalopin takes it over and uh, their deposits like within a year swell from like 10 million to like 84 million. And I think roughly like 71 or seven, I think 71 million of that was just four accounts and 50 million was from one account directly related to Sam Bankman Freed that was called FTX Digital Markets. Um, and at the same time, they, they made this transition in the name, right, from Farmington to Moonstone and tried to make it like this big, you know, crypto uh, focused bank um, is when Alameda Research uh, poured in like 11.5 million. So you have Dell Tech, Alameda and uh, SBF basically like putting the bulk of money and having the bulk of control over this really tiny bank that uh, gets fed approval or approval to be part of the federal reserve system when it like totally should not have. Uh, and uh, the fed still won't comment on the approval process, even though they issued an enforcement action to force Farmington after the FTX scandal to like shut down uh, saying they violated the terms about their like related to their approval, but won't explain what those term was or like how they approved them or anything still. Um, so basically the Fed, in my opinion, is like covering up why they approved them. And it's not just the Fed that's like abetting that cover up. It's also like part of the Washington state government that's like involved with oversight of, you know, the finance, financial services industry in that state. And Moonstone, Moonstone, like around the same time they were, you know, becoming Moonstone, I guess, had also hired like one of the top guys for enforcement actions, like in Washington state from the public sector side. So they were getting like very ready to be very active, I guess you could say. Um, so obviously a lot of stuff going on there and then FTX unravels and, and all of that. And a lot of scrutiny comes on this bank that it shouldn't have been approved. It had all these deposits um, and weird stuff was going on there basically. So I guess that's a recap of what Farmington was. Uh, but right before essentially, like I think a few weeks before the whole FTX thing fell apart, um, Farmington teamed up with Fluent Finance. And Fluent Finance is this company that is essentially based around the stablecoin and stablecoin protocol, US Plus. It's a dollar pig stable coin. And up until this point, uh, SBF, FTX, and Del well, Deltex still is, you know, all involved with Tether. So why are they moving away from, you know, dollar peg stablecoin Tether to this other dollar peg stablecoin US Plus and getting involved with these guys? And I think, um, you know, one major goal of this particular article was to answer that question. So I guess I'll pause there and see where you want to take the convo from here. Yeah, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering like if, what would have happened if FTX didn't fail? Like, would you have been able to write this article? Do you think? Uh, yeah, probably because, uh, Sam Bankman Freed would have been like, yeah, FTX has a stable coin and it's called us plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually um, right before, like a couple days before the collapse, I think it was like the 27th of October. Um, Sam did a, an interview where he talked about how, you know, they're working on a stable coin and, you know, they're looking for the right partner to do it. And, there's pretty much no reason for them not and to. And they're have one. going to announce soon yeah. something about a partnership with a stable coin issuer or something. And this is like a three day or like four day difference from when uh, Farmington Moonstone uh, announced their partnership with Fluent Finance. Yeah. I mean, stable, 
I mean, stable coins generally, it's been fascinating. Obviously, you have Tether, which is the monster in the room, and they've been around for quite Indeed. some time. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm trying yep. to figure out, like, because the CBDC narrative has been out there for years. Stable coins have been proliferating for years. And do you think this was always the intention to backdoor in the CBDCs via stable coins, or do you think the government and these like Fluent and R3? saw the success that Tether was happening and realized like, oh, this is the route we should go. Just dollar. I think always, I think always the, the, the way, I mean, you look at the way the, the government in general has kind of blurred the lines with the private and public sector, you know, uh, they reserve a lot more rights to restrict, you know, customer, you know, access, blacklist things, you know, if, if they kind of operate with a, with a private sector company, you know, I don't think the government actually wants to directly issue a CBDC. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, pain granular points that they have to deal with for doing that. They don't want to have retail accounts, you know, that they're directly responsible for. They want people to buy treasuries and keep this, you know, MIC Ponzi scheme, you know, going. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that this was kind of always the plan. And I think now that we're starting to, you know, we're a little bit more zoomed out a year away from the FTX collapse. I think that, you know, you could kind of look at the FTX collapse as sort of the pillage before the foundation of the digital federal reserve. And now you're seeing Binance getting completely taken over by regulators. We have Tether onboarding the CIA and the FBI. Uh, they're blacklisting addresses at the behest of the, Amer- you know, the American government. Uh, and they're like the biggest net buyers of treasuries of the U S government. Uh, you know, they're like, top 20 country, you know, I think they're like 19th if they were a country of, of owners of, of T-bills. Um, I don't think any of that is an accident, personally. Uh, I definitely it's, think it's on purpose. It's funny with Tether, particularly, and I mean, Matt and I have been talking about this on Rabbit Hole Recap for five years now. Tether, Bitfinex has somewhat been uh, characterized as the pirates of the industry, like operating in this regulatory gray zone for many years, allowing people to evade the long arm of the U.S. government and send U.S. dollar stable coins to each other without KYC, AML. And now, particularly with the onboarding of the Secret Service, the FBI, CIA, and the massive blacklisting that they've done over the last few months, it's like, oh shit, was this just a massive honeypot that's been building for for years, like, do the tether truthers actually have it all wrong? Like, the, the I, I, I think the tether the tether truther thing is like the greatest psyop ever because it really removes people. It's like the issue probably with tether, which I think you know kind of is, is talked about in this article very much, is that tether is like a narrow bank. You know, it's this kind of one to one. They hold the treasuries for all the dollars that they create. They actually hold one to one, and the problem is with that is you can't do fractional reserve banking in the, in the tether model. So we have to create rather than just using T bills that are held by Cantor Fitzgerald, you know, this incredibly spooky, uh, you know, we can get into that later. Um, You know, they need to create this synthetic, you know, deposit security token that then they can rehypothecate and, and basically recreate this fractional reserve banking system that, uh, you know, these, these folks have enjoyed for, you know, years and years and years you know the reason jamie diamond was like with elizabeth warren was like we should ban all crypto if i was the government i would do that that's because the commercial banks like jp morgan want to be the the entities issuing the dollar pick stable coins or the whatever stable coins or deposit tokens they want to take you know the tether crowd and paolo and all of those guys that they want to do it they don't want these other companies to do it yeah which makes complete sense i mean yeah, so. and these same, you know, a bank issued stablecoin is still just as surveillable and programmable as like a hypothetical CBDC would be. But this one to one reserve thing is a big problem for them because the bank's whole, I mean, they want to keep their casino going. They need fractional reserve stuff uh, to follow their existing models, business model. They have no intention of changing that. And, it's, you know, when you keep in mind, too, that like in the, in the States specifically, the central bank is owned by the wall street banks like they're going to direct obviously what the central bank policy will be with respect to digital dollars right so you know there's a reason why i think the fed has been so like 
unwilling to be like, yeah, we're going to do a CBDC. They've been very like, you know, we don't know, we're not looking at it, you know, and there's people that have taken that as a sign that like the Fed is fighting against CBDCs, right? Um, but not so, not so. It's yeah, it just looks- one that's issued by, you know, the people that <laughs> we definitely know steal from. Our, I mean, it's just a different group of thieves in charge of like programming and surveilling. Uh, but they, you know, are obviously going to collaborate with the same with the government. It's going to be a public private partnership, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Fed now, I mean, there might be an actual direct issue CBDC, but that'll probably be for like interbank settlement or something like right. that. It's not going to be what like the exactly- public interacts with. Totally. And that's exactly what Fed now is. It's really just mm-hmm. a, it's a securities uh, clearing system. Uh, it, it allows them basically to set the rate of, you know, sec- securitized overnight, you know, funding that the SOFR um, and, and basically allows the, the Fed further, you know, ability to, you know, survey, you know, the securities trading between Federal Reserve partner banks. It just gives them more control, but it, but of course it isn't an actual product. You know, there's no token, there's no there's no retail accounts. It's it's literally just like a communication system between banks. Um, and yeah, and, and then we're seeing, of course, you know, if you actually look at the the pilot programs that the the <clears throat> the Fed has actually done um, with some of the regional Federal Reserve banks, you know, the two main ones that get referenced are Project Cedar and Project Hamilton. And Project Hamilton is the retail facing, you know, how many transactions per second, kind of the throughput of what would be kind of the retail, um, you know, facing one. And that was through um, the Boston Fed with MIT. And then there's um, Cedar, which is actually like a securitized token deposit. And that's kind of the the other side. And those are really the two sides of you know, the dollar system, right? There's the securities and the T-bills behind it. And then there's the actual dollars created in your checking accounts that are done by the private sector. You know, that's done private capital creators, um, you know, that is increasingly moving towards, you know, the JP Morgan uh, of the world and literally JP Morgan, right? So I think we're, that, that, that whole system, this whole racket is exceptionally profitable uh, for these people. And, you know, just because there's new tech coming out, uh, you know, they don't want to lose this racket. So how do we how do we capture that within the system we already have? And, and the way that you do that is by creating synthetic deposit tokens. Well, that brings up a good segue because it seems like because if we look at it, the monetary system right now, the financial system right now, one can make a strong argument. The CBDCs are essentially already here. These entities have the ability to censor and deplatform, demonetize people at will, but it seems like they would be able to do it much more easily if they were to adopt new tech. And so I guess this is a good point to basically describe the, like you mentioned, Mark, they're paving the way for this new tech. They're getting SPF out of the way, getting uh, CZ out of the way, probably trying to muscle out uh, Palo and Tether as well. And what is a technical architecture of the tokenized dollar system that they're building look like. And then, like you mentioned, the security system looks like they're also trying to replace the DTCC um, mm. right now as well. Yeah, or maybe not replace it and just kind of uh, like transmute it into, you know, I mean, literally the, the DTCC, you know, uh, you know, working with R3, I mean, they, they settle the lion's share of, um, you know, of, of security settlement in, in the United States, um, which is obviously the lion's share of all security settlement in the world. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to see, uh, you know, some digital version of, of these T-bills um, that, that decrease the settlement failure rate, um, which obviously, you know, it happens. You know, there's a lot of settlement failure in the treasury market. And it's really interesting when you go and look back at, points in history where the the major spikes of settlement failure rates in the United States, the main ones are, the most obvious ones are September 2001, which was 9-11. Interestingly, Cantor Fitzgerald, who owns the Tether T-bills, were in, you know, their office was in 9-11 and all of it was, you know, destroyed. And uh, they passed some emergency measures that day to, uh, 
settle some treasuries that wouldn't have been settled. Um, and you can, you can get kind of into a rabbit hole there. But And then, of course, uh, you know, September 2019, uh, there was the huge explosion in the repo market uh, mm-hmm. right before, uh, you know, uh, what, what happened in 2020? I kind of, oh, yeah, yeah COVID, uh, government lockdowns, uh, and, you know, trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus printing, right? Um, I don't think that's a coincidence, personally. Neither do I. I fell down the Cantor Fitzgerald rabbit hole after their CEO was on CNBC talking about um, Tether and crypto and Bitcoin. And there was a documentary about the families of the Cantor Fitzgerald employees that were lost on 9-11. And he was a complete scumbag in the aftermath. Yeah. Well, there was definitely a media effort to rehabilitate him after that. Uh, he mm-hmm. was also Epstein's neighbor. Fun fact. Really? And uh, yeah, and <laughs> the, ha- the house yeah, it used to be owned by Epstein and Wexner and all of those guys. Oh, um, lovely. Just you know, yep. what? It's. I mean, Whitney, you know, we've been doing this for years. Making now. a cheery like, neighborhood. Bill Cosby's there too. You know, just. We've been doing this for years, and every. Every episode we record, I become more astonished at how small the circle is and how interconnected it is over decades. Yeah, it's pretty small. And there's I mean, more than people. You're mentioning Perlman. Others are involved in this stablecoin slash CBDC mm-hmm. evolution. Yeah, the, the Cantor stuff and the Tether stuff is really interesting too, where if you look at, you know, Max Kaiser holds this patent for uh, virtual security trading, right, that he filed... Uh, in the late 90s, that was the backbone, the patent that they used for this Hollywood stock exchange, um, which was a simulated digital securities trading platform uh, that referenced in the initial patent, referenced the Cantor Fitzgerald patent from a few months before. A few years later, Cantor Fitzgerald buys out Kaiser from the board of the Hollywood Stock Exchange, takes all of that throws it into the office, uh, you know, a couple months before September 11th. Um, and then, of course, it all blows up in the uh, events of that day. Um, and, of course, you know, we see heavy involvement with Tether and Cantor Fitzgerald. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, because now we're getting to this point where it's very clear that the next play is virtual security settlement and trading. Um, and that, you know, yes, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world, but really the reserve asset of the world is U.S. treasuries. And that's really the, for me, you know, I wrote this book, The Bitcoin Dollar, that's kind of proposes like, hey, let's not even really worry about the dollar right now. I don't even know if Bitcoin can replace the dollar, but what it can replace is the U.S. treasuries. It can replace treasuries as a reserve asset for a new financial system if we do it right and if we do it well. But if we kind of allow this dollarization and these kind of stablecoin spooks to sort of come in and encourage Bitcoiners to support companies uh, that buy up treasuries in mass, um, you know, we're seeing tether reintegrations and strike. You know, we're seeing a lot of uh, people that are very uh, cozy to to stablecoins and to tether. And, and they're, you know, these huge net buyers of treasuries when actually Bitcoin kind of is you know, poised potentially to really disrupt this reserve asset system. Um, I just think it's something Bitcoiners should be really aware of um, as we move forward and what what kind of practices and systems and architecture that we, uh, you know, promote. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, um, you have to imagine they're thinking of sly roundabout ways to undermine The end goal of Bitcoin, which is to replace that system. Yeah. (laughs) Integrating um, at the hip together. And so I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's naive to think that they wouldn't do that. I mean, if something, if you, if a tool is created to stick it right to commercial and central banks and like prevent malfeasance on their part, if they can co-opt it, to become part of their system and part of their malfeasance and enable their malfeasance, they will definitely do that. It's not like they're going to be like, Oh, well you invented Bitcoin. You got us. You know, that's not how these guys. (laughs) All right. We give up. You guys won. 
Yeah. And arguably, you know, and I think this is something I get into in the book as well is like, you know, I think the dollar system probably needs Bitcoin more than like Bitcoin needs the dollar system. Right. I mean, it's the dollar system has now passed 33 trillion. Like we're at this runaway, uh, you know, debt service where, you know, the amount of money the U.S. owes just to pay its debt is now surpassed mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the, the GDP growth in a year. You know, we're a zombie company. You know, you would take us out back and old yeller us if, you know, you were, if we were a dog, it's like this, like, or, you know, we're just, we're not, there's no way to fix this without massive, massive money printing and, and stimulus to, to service this debt. There's just no other way. We can't increase tax receipts enough to, to, to service this debt. Um, so what do you do? You print a bunch to pay for it. Well, now we have this sort of demand inelastic, uh, you know, disinflationary supply cap system that can actually suck up all of this excess liquidity that comes from money printing. And then what do we see? You know, now that we're seeing ETFs start to go, we're starting to see Bitcoin start to increase again. And now we have the regulatory moat is like finished being built. Um, We're seeing Basel III requirements coming in that are forcing financial institutions to hold equal parts dollar to Bitcoin or dollar to gold. So if we start to see these you know, in actuality, kind of hyperinflationary events in the dollar system, uh, we have sort of, no pun intended, you know, tethered uh, the dollar to to Bitcoin price appreciation uh, from a financial regulatory standpoint. Yeah. Now, when you, I keep saying yeah after everything I say, I got to stop that. Uh, the uh, <laughs> something I'm conscious of, but like the timing of all of this, whether it's the over the last year, getting SBF out of the way, getting CZ out of the way, completely cucking Tether. And then in parallel, you have <laughs> the Treasury coming out, writing that letter, Jamie Dimon, the rest of the executives on Capitol Hill, Elizabeth Warren, dropping this bill. And then we have the ETF, which seems to be uh, approaching imminent approval, maybe in the next couple of weeks. It, it does seem very coordinated to me. And then I think there's also, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's a, even more stuff to be cognizant of. Like, remember the DOJ holds an insane amount of Bitcoin and that's probably only going to increase. So like with Binance, a ton of DOJ people have access, not just to every uh, transaction on that exchange from now going forward, but also everything in the past. What happens if they flag past transactions and retroactively start seizing wallets? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, They could do that. And um, I think uh, with a lot of this stuff that has, I've, you know, been warning about for a long time, but we've seen it escalate a lot since October 7th, this claim that Bitcoin specifically is being used to finance terrorism. And you're having these, these pushes, uh, uh, you know, to regulate based on that, like under a national security justification. I think that's a recipe for like even more DOJ, like, seizures specifically of bitcoin and so you know why is the doj so interested in accumulate or you know it's a major arm of the u.s government so like the u.s government more broadly interested in accumulating so much bitcoin and holding on to it and also um basically creating like national security justifications to literally take anyone's bitcoin they could possibly want under a variety of like insanely vague metrics like You know, like I've talked about before, the DOJ is part of this this WEF organization uh, that wants to label people who are accused of publishing misinformation online as cyber criminals and cyber terrorism who should have their domains and assets seized. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I mean, obviously, that's like everybody here. (laughs) The DOJ could eventually like, you know, it's a it's a really broad net. But why are they setting that system up? You know what I mean? And I think it's important to keep in mind, too, that, you know, uh, like Gary Gensler of the SEC has made it clear very consistently for a while now uh, that Bitcoin is the only digital currency viewed from the SEC's perspective as a commodity. Everything else is a security to Gary Gensler. So they're going to you know, that's a pretty unique status. They want to treat it as a commodity as they move everything into the digital currency space. And they have plans to do that and use it for their benefit. And to think they wouldn't do that is like, I, I think personally really naive. I mean, of course they would. 
Get your yeah, the U.S. holds the lion's share for sure of Bitcoin from a retail standpoint and from, yeah, as you said, a seizure standpoint. And I think, again, I, you know, just an interesting way to get this, you know, you reference Marty, the circle being so small. It's like Bitfinex, that huge hack, you know, yeah, years ago, the DOJ has, has, all that, has all that coin, you know, and the SEC has them by the balls because they did that Leo token to pay back everybody that got their Bitcoin hacked, which obviously was a security obviously how much do right? see so, and, and if you go over like to the bitfinex hackers like the rapper couple right or whatever, it's like what? yeah, razzlecon yeah yep. and, you know, she was actually a regular at my bar that i used to work at a bar in uh in the bay area and i like knew her as a as a as a regular when the whole thing happened i was like this is the biggest fucking psyop i've ever seen there's no yeah. way these people did this there's no way they held it in a google drive account there's no fucking way any of this is Anyway, it that's all, speculation, yeah. but how, how much did the DOJ get? <laughs> yeah. the, the original hack was like 116,000 Bitcoin, I believe. I believe yeah, they something got like that. Um, yeah, it was like 92. I think it was just below 100. Yeah, something like that. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. No, it has been because historically, when they've seized the Silk Road coins uh, and coins for, from other uh, hacks or whatever, or legal operations that they took down, they've auctioned them off, but they haven't done that with the Bitfinex coins, which they've been sitting on for, I think, over a year now. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they haven't signaled that they're going to auction them yet. So you think they're going to Yeah, it's funny. Talking about this circle again, it's like, well, who does the, who who do they sell them through? They sell them through Coinbase. Coinbase has gotten in trouble from the SEC for securities things, but asked on list stuff. They are also the custodians of the cash create spot ETF for BlackRock for, you know, for everybody, right? So there's just this like, you know, mutually assured destruct, you know, that meme of everybody in the church holding the guns against, the, you know, it's like that is the situation we're in of the Bitcoin space right now. It's like fall in line or we blow this whole thing up, you know, it's it's very, very interesting. Yeah. So like I said, yeah, God, God damn it. As it pertains to <laughs> this transition to the commercial bank controlled stablecoin quasi cbdc where are they in terms of their roadmap and how quickly do you think they can get to market with it that's a pretty good question well i mean so basically i you know in this article it focuses on this particular network that fluent finance which was partnered with you know this sbf dell tech thing um, they're sort of in this network with like the XDC network um, and R3, right? And R3 is developing CBDCs all over the world, but they also have like a more, like they're casting a wider net than just CBDCs. They have this thing called the Digital Currency Accelerator, and they're basically focusing on not just CBDCs, but, you know, deposit tokens and stable coins. So like any entity, banks, central banks, whatever, can like sandbox and like test out uh, their digital currency and, and, you know, add programmability and all this stuff that like, you know, people are concerned about when it comes to CBDCs as it relates to impacts on individual freedoms, specifically financial freedoms. Right. So they're like, they've created all these tools to, you know, make it happen really fast. The The question is, I think at the end of the day, like trust and adoption. And so, you know, what I've sort of brought up um, on some recent interviews um, is, is this, you know, stuff I've been writing about since 2021, how the biggest banks in the world and the biggest central bank, some of the most important central banks in the world um, in this WEF partnership uh, and the Carnegie Endowment, which at the time was run by the current CIA director, uh, were basically gaming out financial cyber or cyber attacks on the financial system. And a lot of people don't know this, but the entire financial services industry in the U.S., so like all of the big banks have an ISAC, which is an information information sharing and analysis center where they their CISOs all get together like privately and like game out threats to the system and how to respond to them. So like all the Wall Street banks have a have had since 2021, like a unified plan about what they'll do if there's a big cyber attack on the banks. And so if you're like, you know, the biggest bank, these same banks that cost 2008, and you know that they're another banking crisis and like economic calamity is inevitable and you don't want to be blamed by people when they're angry about their money not really having value anymore 
you know, how do you get around that? You know, I don't think they want a repeat of Occupy Wall Street. I think that's pretty clear, right? So how do you, you know, get around that? Well, you're like, oh, well, these faceless hackers took over the financial system and we have to relaunch it um, with these things because it's more secure and, you know, we'll know who everybody is, you know, because uh, there's this parallel push to end online anonymity and financial privacy going on here, uh, which is part of this whole like narrative too about like Bitcoin and, you know, financing terror transactions and stuff. Like it's all about like KYC and like linking your digital ID and government issued ID to, you know, every transaction and having even the smallest transaction, $1, 50 cents, you know, is surveillable by the, the banks and the government. Right. So People aren't just going to be like, yeah, let's do that system if they launch it without some sort of event that causes, you know, fear and panic. So I think it's likely it'll get rolled into some sort of like cyber Patriot Act after some sort of mass cyber event that the banks have all gained out. And the WEF, which runs this partnership, the banks and all these intelligence agencies are a part of, say it is going to happen before January 2025. They said that. So the the. the whether you want to call it predictive programming or pacing and leading the public. I mean, you had Anthony Blinken, I believe on Capitol Hill saying, I think Lindsey Graham asked him like, how big is the threat right now? Are you seeing blinking lights? Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Blinking, blinking lights, lights <laughs> everywhere we turn. It was Christopher Ray, <laughs> head of the FBI. Yeah. And yeah, Lindsey Graham was like, so is there going to be another nine 11, Chris? Everywhere I turn, the answer is yeah. I mean, it's basically what that was. And I mean, yeah. they do this all the time. Like before January 6, this top lady at DHS basically was like, we can see another 9-11 building and we can't stop it. And it's going to be Trump supporter insurrectionists and all this stuff. And then, you know, immediately January 6 happens and all these like CIA, former CIA veterans that had just been elected to Congress, mostly on the Democrat ticket. Uh, we're all on like cable news being like, this is America's second 9-11, just like all on the same immediately, dude. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, I don't think they, 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 well, they have, they have kind of two like sort of modes of uh, levers, right? They have this fear based, which obviously they simulate fear and, you know, that's the whole 9-11 into Patriot Act and into all this stuff. And then they have the other side, right? Which is like this convenience thing that they build, which, you know, mm -hmm. you look at what they've done and in this private public, you know, sector blur, obviously, you know, Whitney, you've written a lot about, you know, the DARPA project life log being Facebook, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then we look at kind of what they did with fucking Venmo. And it's like, they created this public social media network for like paying each other and making, you know, it's like, if I, if I look at a Venmo, I can see people that I was friends with, like in high school or whatever that are sending, you know, paying their bills and stuff. And I can see how much they're paying. I mean, it's total madness. And they're doing that as this, like, sort of this form of convenience. Amazing. And you look at Venmo, right, exactly. And you're looking at Venmo integrating, uh, you know, they're all, they're in part of the PayPal mafia, you know, group, the suite of project uh, products. And now they're integrating um, I did an interview with Walter Hessert of, of the head of strategy at Paxos asking him about the PayPal USD. Uh, and he very specifically said that, you know, I don't think the USDT and USDC model from a regulatory standpoint is going to last. Um, but what I do see somehow also is trillions and trillions of dollars of stable coins coming into the market. So he's, he's basically signaling that, you know, through this PayPal Venmo, you know, convenience stick, you know, or the carrot, not the stick, uh, you know, they're, they're going to, you know, basically take over uh, the, the stable coin market from these other entities um, and, and, and wrap it back into the, the PayPal Stripe teal verse, um, you know, cabal basically. Be wary. Just to elaborate on that really quick. So what, what Mark meant, I guess when he brought up like LifeLog and, and Facebook. So like LifeLog and these other programs, which also brought us Palantir, another Peter Thiel right. PayPal mafia company. Um, they tried to make this insane Panopticon program after 9-11 called Total Information Awareness. Look up the logo. It's very illuminating. Um, and basically the goal, they put like an Iran-Contra criminal in charge of it who was obsessed with like mass surveillance for the purpose of pre-crime and arresting people for like potentially threatening 
the existing status quo of the government and like protesting war nonviolently and stuff um, in charge of this DARPA public private partnership uh, called total information awareness that was going to suck up everyone's data and predictably, uh, you know, just enable a pre-crime type of surveillance dragnet, uh, very unconstitutional stuff. And I think the, the, the national security state realized then because there was a huge uproar about it, that people were not willing to accept that if the government was overtly involved, but they would if it appeared at least as a purely private sector venture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the same, I think, is true for CBDCs. They've seen this pushback of people don't want CBDCs and no to central bank control. They don't want the government issuing the CBDC and the government programming and surveilling the money. So I think they're going to do what they did with total information awareness and use private entities like, you know, JP Morgan, the same banks that everyone, you know, most people use now uh, and have them be the issuers of the de facto CBDC or rather the synthetic CBDC is the term that gets thrown around some as well. And CBD, uh, synthetic CBDCs, you know, as defined by the people that use that term is something like a stable coin with a twist which means that the reserves are backed up by the Fed or backed up with the Fed. That's one thing and, people really mm -hmm. need to begin to internalize is this whole demarcation between public and private is a complete mirage. <laughs> the, the, yes. I mean, the, the private sector via lobbying dollars and control the Fed. The Fed, the money is the most important tool on the planet. The Fed is a private entity owned by the commercial banks. Yeah, and essentially hold the economy and by extension the government by the balls. There is no real demarcation, particularly at this point. Yeah, and it's going to get even worse. The terms of like the blending of these of these groups because um, that same Carnegie Endowment thing that I mentioned with like all the big U.S. Uh, U.S. banks, the Fed, uh, the ECB, the Bank of England, and like tech companies and stuff. Uh, their solution to cyber attack problems or a coming cyber pandemic was to basically merge banks, banking regulators, and intelligence agencies. Hmm. And if you just look at the number of things that are happening in parallel, like we're hyper-focused on the financial system and the monetary system right now. And you mentioned the digital ID mm -hmm. for sending and receiving transactions. It'll be tracked Granularly, yeah. they're doing the same thing mm -hmm. on social media and just pure information as well, where they're really trying mm -hmm. to silo people into these censored platforms. They're trying to pass laws around hate speech and what's happening in the UK in Ireland right now. Yeah. Not, and and they're they're pairing that with like gutting encryption too, specifically in the UK. Yep. And gutting yeah. the open source software in the EU. Mm -hmm. the EU setting the stage to ban open source software because it's too dangerous. Dan dangerous. Yeah. I mean, expect a lot of these terms to be thrown out. I mean, um, you know, if and when this big cyber attack that they're predictively programming happens, the enemy is going to be privacy. They're going to be like, we can't have privacy anymore. That's what they're going to say. I, I guarantee that because that's the only way they can, you know, basically force adoption of all this stuff they want to do, which is CBDC's digital ID is they want everything you do online to be completely surveillable. And that includes financial transactions, like specifically financial transactions. And so people for a long time have rightly pointed out that digital IDs and CBDCs are like, you know, they go together, right? You, you get, you get both. It's not just like one or the other, like it's a very like integrated thing. Um, and, you know, this is all also tied up with this uh, goal to have the driver's license for the internet that you have to have, you know, your digital ID or government issued ID to, tied to everything you do online. Um, and whatever happens with this thing, they're going to blame whoever they want, really, because we know with like WikiLeaks Vault 7, right, the, the CIA through the Umbridge program can put like the fingerprints of literally any nation state or person they want in any cyber attack and blame them. It was Russian bots. Yeah, or they can, you know, like they've been doing recently, not actually have any evidence, but then get a mainstream media highlight that says, Iran hacked this, China hacked this. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Like, it's all just fake, you know? And a lot of those companies attributing blame, like Recorded Future, for example, has a recent one that's been surfacing. They were created by the CIA, InQtel. 
you know, so like, <laughs> you really want to trust these guys saying like, we were attacked by this nation, trust like the intelligence front company that wants to push all of this through because the CIA director was in charge of this like whole thing that mapped out how to like bring down the banks and launch all of this shit. I mean, it's just, it's mental. It seems I don't like know what setting, else to say about it. It seems like they're setting up Iran to be the scapegoat here with what's going on. Well, sure. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's a big Israel component here. So like that WEF partnership against cybercrime I mentioned is led by a career Israeli uh, intelligence guy named Tal Goldstein. Um, and then you have this uh, stuff that I've reported on recently. Uh, well, a couple years ago, but it's become recently relevant, like the CTI League, um, which has a, a big relationship with like, you know, a, a, a key part <clears throat> of the US's DHS as it relates to critical infrastructure and like cyber attacks and stuff. Um, and, and the guy that created CTI League, uh, Ohad Zadenberg, has been his whole career blaming Iran for stuff with little to no evidence uh, for cyber attacks and uh, is still pretty much an inactive Israeli intelligence asset. And Israeli intelligence uh, for the past like 20 years has had like a documented admitted policy of trying to get the US uh, to di use as many resources as possible to further regime change in Iran, including the US uh, striking Iran first so Israel doesn't have to. And you even have former Mossad directors like Mayor Dagan literally saying that. And also well, saying that Mossad has like unlimited funds and powers to make that happen and have a five front strategy for regime change in Iran that includes like goading the U.S. into striking Iran first. And when you factor in stuff like Israel and the USS Liberty, where Israel tried to get us involved in one of their regional wars uh, by blowing up a U.S. ship and killing, uh, you know, U.S., uh, you know, naval personnel and then blaming it on Egypt to try yeah, false flagged us hard to try and get us involved in their war. And now they're about to have a regional war again. Yeah. I mean, they're about, I mean, they've openly said like in the past couple of days, it's going to go beyond Gaza and they're going to declare war on Hezbollah now, which well, is Lebanon. I, did you see, right? did, you, did you see, so two things happened this week, Iran and Iraq, I think engaged in a deal to explore oil reserves together and like in a joint mm -hmm. venture to produce revenue for their countries. And then this week, Biden announced <coughs> tactical uh, hits on strategic areas in Iraq. Um, just somewhat out of nowhere. It's going to escalate. I mean, it's obviously was I, in my opinion, just like planned from the off to escalate to a regional war because every effort to de-escalate has intentionally been scuttled by the U.S. and Israel. Right. It's, Not yeah. unlike what happened in Ukraine and like how Boris Johnson, when he was in charge of the U.K., scuttled that like they could that war could have ended like very early on and he scuttled it on purpose. You know, there's like an intentionality here to keep this going mm -hmm. and to expand it. And people need to keep in mind, too, that Iran is now part of BRICS. And that includes like not, you know, in to an extent, some form of like military alliance, you know. So there's a potential to like bring in China and Russia to all of this. And you have all this stuff going on in the Pacific theater as well. I mean, I don't want to get too like into geopolitics right now because I also haven't been following it like super closely. It's the holidays and that stuff like develops really, uh, you know, rapidly. Right. But there's definitely, it's going to go regional and, and Israel will not want to be fighting that alone. And so to get the U S to specifically the U S public to consent, at least a f significant faction of the U S public to consent that people in the U S need to feel like they're under attack also. And there's been this like framing too of like, oh, the border is so porous and the, the US-Mexico border and Netanyahu saying like, uh, you know, Hamas sleeper cells uh, could come to the US and all the shit, you know. Well, that's, that's makes pretty wild. Sense. And then they, and then the IDF put out this, or maybe an Israeli embassy put out like this video of Hamas like blowing up a, a Christmas parade in, in South Korea and like all this stuff. Yeah, the story of I mean, border patrol. What's going finding, on, guys? Finding IEDs at the border, and which th that's well, like, I, that's where it's like so blatant in your face. It's like they're letting yeah 
tens of thousands of people coming in a day now. And then they're also like, there could be sleeper cells. It's like, why don't you just close the border? Are you trying to? <laughs> but they're, they're, it's an intentional thing. You know, this is something that, that really gets me sometimes is because like people look at stuff like the border policy right now. And they're like, oh, it's just incompetence because look, we have the senile guy who's president. Well, yes, but no one, you know, who actually is serious thinks Biden makes any decisions. He's no. just a figurehead. Well, arguably like US presidents on. have been for decades. Yeah. So like- there's people that want, I mean, he doesn't run DHS. There's like non-senile people in charge of DHS, for example, right? I mean, it's not all like, oh, senile Biden. He's senile, thus all U.S. policy decisions or lack thereof are because of, you know, him being senile. That's just, that's not how it works. It's like a very deliberate thing. And a lot of times things that are deliberate are written off as like incompetence or stupidity. And um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's the case here. No. I think I can tie some of this regional stuff mm -hmm. kind of back to the, you know, this sort of dollar Bitcoin oil stuff, right? Yes. Where like, if you look at, if you look at March 2020, when we had that big COVID implosion of stock market, <laughs> gold, oil futures went negative, um, you know, that was a few weeks before the happening which was the, a very important happening where uh, issuance, relative issuance actually went, you know, to six and a quarter Bitcoin a block, which relative to the total supply was the first time, you know, Bitcoin issuance was below 2%, which is the relative, you know, the target inflation rate of the US dollar, the target, uh, or like the, you know, the rate of gold coming out of the ground is around 2% and oil as well, right? So we kind of saw the petrodollar system essentially go tits up that day uh and now we're seeing it being replaced by it's the exact same mechanism of an energy commodity that through a monopoly of the exchange of the in and out of the energy commodity being in dollars which is what we're seeing with bitcoin you know that's how they upheld the petrodollar system was this monopoly on hey you want to industrialize you want to modernize your country you want to buy oil you got to buy dollars first we can shovel all of this inflationary effects into europe and into asia and have all these people buying t-bills and buying cash to buy oil now we're seeing the exact same thing uh set up with bitcoin um and now we're seeing a whole bunch of you know our, our regional policy has really changed considerably you know i mean we're all relatively the same age right and you know, our entire life has been about being in the Middle East and, and mucking around in the oil fields, right? And then all of a sudden, we're out of Afghanistan. Uh, we pull out and leave a whole bunch of shit there. It becomes no longer economically viable to continue this, like, money laundering uh, oil scheme. And then, you know, they go on and, you know, obviously do what they were doing in Ukraine, which has a huge component of money laundering via crypto, which is very interesting. But we've established basically, you know, the Bitcoin dollar uh in lieu of the petrodollar system and if the world wants access to this energy commodity they need to buy dollars first um and i think we're seeing that sort of play out and in an extreme way right as we're getting ready for another happening where this where this issuance gets cut in half again and we're going to see that even be more extreme and now we're setting up with regulatory action etfs like everything that has happened the last four years between this happening and, and this next happening are uh, entirely by design, you could argue. And I think to the point of the digital ID stuff, to the point like, you know, the regulatory moat is built, but maybe we don't know all the components yet. But when they monetize Bitcoin to the rate at which they want it to, and it really does get, you know, extremely high in U.S. dollar value. Uh, you know, there's going to be so many more requirements in the U.S. for citizens to be able to use it. Um, exchanges are going to get more and more and more KYC. There's going to be, hey, take a selfie and scan your face to be able to, you know, sell on Coinbase or whatever. You know, we're kind of moving towards that that world. And I think, you know, we obviously have to just be exceptionally careful you know bitcoin has really entered the macro world in, in, in a very extreme way um and it's right before i think we kick off an election cycle right before we kick off probably a, a debt jubilee of sorts um if there is another cyber attack or another lockdown or any of these things that we all basically are just waiting for to happen again 
you know, there's going to be massive stimulus and the next stimulus is not going to be five trillion dollars, six trillion dollars. It's going to be 40 trillion, 50 trillion. You know, we're going to see really extreme stuff. If I can add something on the border really quick. So the whole mess on the border, too, in terms of its intentionality. So it's not just happening in the U.S. It's a, it's happening sim- in similar ways in a lot of other countries. In my opinion, this is one of the main ways they're going to shoehorn in digital ID. We have to know who everyone is because there's too many migrants and we have to know who has what rights and who can do what. And so we all need digital ID for everybody that's biometric and all of this stuff. And I'm sure they'll invent something like, oh, there's fraud, there's fake IDs. We have to have secure interoperable IDs, just like a designed by ID 2020 and then SGG 16 and whatever. Yeah, so that's definitely gonna be part of it. And then you have this whole added thing of like, something crazy is obviously gonna happen with the economy next year, whether it's provoked by a cyber attack or whatever, the way the UN, UNICEF, World Food Program has set up all of their stuff for humanitarian aid is the world coin model, which is Mm. scan your eyeball and we give you a digital ID and that tells us whether or not you eat or not. You know, if you want to get your rations, you have to go to the wherever the rations are and have your eyeball scanned. And if there's a mistake in the system and it decides you're not you, no food for you. And this has happened in India's digital ID system at hard to like a significant degree and they haven't fixed it and they don't do anything about it. And they justified it by saying that like people's data will be safer and more secure. It's the most easily hackable thing in the world. There was like a, a big, big time like Indian CEO guy that was like, I'm publicly going to like put up my ad ID number and like, look how safe it is. And it was like hacked in like 10 minutes and people like trolled the crud out of him. You know, I mean, it's a joke, um, but they need to manufacture consent for all of this stuff. And the way they're going to do that is fear and panic. There's obviously going to be some sort of national security crisis they have to create to bring in that fear and panic, but they're creating the base issues on purpose. I mean, it's an intentional decision to have the border in that state. And it's not just happening in the U.S. It's like a broader thing, just like digital ID is like a global thing. And, you know, talking about the geopolitical stuff, you know, the divide here of, you know, BRICS versus the West, specifically like U.S., U.K., Israel, Europe, the EU, um, they all agree on digital ID. So, like, yeah, there's this geopolitical tension stuff at one level, but go another level up, they all agree about some sort of surveillable, programmable money. Maybe in the U.S. it's synthetic DPD, CBDCs in China and the BRICS countries. It's direct issue CBDC. They all agree about digital IDs that are biometric. They all agree on Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Yeah. And what's interesting about that, well, to take it back to the article in Fluent Finance, the United Arab Emirates, what are they setting up financially? What is Fluent Finance after Farmington gets shut down, specifically doing in the United Arab Emirates. They're the connective tissue between the CBDCs, direct issue CBDCs of BRICS land and the synthetic CBDCs of the West and the deposit tokens. That's what they're setting up. That's what Fluent Finance is doing in the UAE right now uh, with R3. That's partnered with the DTCC for the securities stuff that Mark was talking about earlier um, and doing the central bank digital currency for the UAE. Uh, and a a host of other countries that are interoperable with a lot of other ones specifically being overseen by the BIS. These MCBD projects for like multi-CBDC projects about interoperability. Uh, The goal is to have, you know, Corda, the R3 DLT, right? Have that as much run on that as possible, but what doesn't run on that will be interoperable with that. So interoperability is like a key thing to watch out for. And a lot of these companies like, like Fluent Finance, for example, are developing this stuff and like no one has noticed, which I, f- I think is kind of interesting. Like a lot of people that are so focused on CBDCs and they're a threat to human freedom and all of this are just pointing the finger at like bricks and not paying attention to any of these other countries, really. They're just like BIS bad, but like, yeah, um, you know, Wall Street has plans for this too. And like, they're not good either. Like Jamie Dimon and Jerome Powell are not coming to the rescue, guys. They're creating the same system under a different name. Well, um, it's funny to mention that don't, because Jamie Dimon programming my dollars to expire and uh, tying it to my carbon credits or whatever is not any better than Jerome Powell or uh, 
I don't know, Janet Yellen doing it. I mean, it's yeah. all the same it's a, garbage. It's, it's a no. red herring, really. It's like, we're going to get this false victory of like, oh man, you know, DeSantis signed a bill that says, you know, no CBD issuance in Florida. Like, fuck yeah. But it's like, but now we got Bradley Allgood coming in. in time. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I exactly. You, it's when you sent me the piece to read over uh, before you guys publish it, I remember messaging you, Whitney. I was like, I thought R3 had been shoveled into the dustbin of irrelevance. And I think no. many Bitcoiners believe that because around 2015, 2016, when I was in New York, they had like a big presence, they had a big social media presence. They were publicly speaking on CNBC, if I recall correctly, and really making this push for distributed ledger technology for corporations. And I thought they just petered out and never found product market fit and faded away. But as your article proves, they've been very successful in creating these partnerships via their Quarta platform, which I thought was defunct. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt. And, you know, what I think is interesting, too, to take this back to FTX, too, you know, in light of their team up with Fluent Finance and what Fluent Finance has gone on to do, I really am curious, and I, I don't really know if there's any way to know now, but, you know, all those donations and cozying up to, like, you know, Elizabeth Warren and all these other, like, lawmakers by FTX executives or Ryan Salome cozying up with the Republicans and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. was this to uh, have them favor the stablecoin FTX was going to team up with, which seems to have been Fluent Finance's US Plus, like, to favor them as, like, you know, the stablecoin issuer of choice for the synthetic CBDC? Pretty interesting uh, possibility there because a lot of it thought it was just like, oh, crypto regu you know, regulation to favor uh, you know, FTX and SBF and stuff. But I think there's a lot of bigger plays that have been going on here for some time. And I think people ignoring these kind of actors, we're doing ourselves a disservice. If you look at the people who created Fluent Finance, the main guy, Bradley Algood, used to work for like NATO and like military <laughs> intelligence stuff. And then immediately starts making special economic zones out of a building on this Indian reservation in South Carolina to like replace Delaware as a place where like companies register to like get tax advantages and stuff. And that, I mean, and then goes on to team up with uh, this guy, Oliver Gale, who is a failed reggae artist uh, who claims to be the inventor <laughs> of CBDCs. And the other guy was with him in that first CBDC project in Barbados. Mm -hmm. So the lines. inventors of CBDC team up with like NATO spook guy uh, to create the SBF stable coin. That's what well, was going on before FTX uh, collapsed. And so, yeah, maybe SBF is like out of the picture and whatever, but this isn't going away. Like fluent finance. Okay. Yeah. We can't do the thing with Moonstone and with Chalopine and Dell tech and FTX, but we can do it with our three which was partnered with, you know, Fluent Finance, like pretty much from the very beginning, because R3 started off as a consortium of like some of the biggest banks in the world, and their backers are still the biggest banks in the world. And there's a lot of overlap between how Fluent Finance started and those same banks that back R3, specifically Citibank, uh, HSBC, and Barclays, which yeah. uh, if you know the history of any of those banks... Not good. And then you have Bradley uh, Allgood, the, the fluent finance guy, like publishing op-eds and, and Cointelegraph and stuff being like, CBDCs would be great if they put Wall Street in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and all That's these literally what it says. I mean, it's just, they're telling you, but no one's yeah. paying attention because they're like, well, oh, well, look, <clears throat> these Fed chairs are saying we're not going to do a digital dollar. And that means freedom wins in the good old USA. No, what happens in the USA is that uh, Wall Street steals from everyone and funnels the money to the oligarch class and leaves everyone dirt poor. That's what they're going to do. Well, it's <laughs> it's not good. Me. Please don't trust them. <laughs> you know, like, I just don't know what to say to people who are like, Jamie Dimon's on our side anymore. Like, and Jerome Powell, like, they're not. He's red-blooded. I promise you they're future. not. He's got your best interest at heart. But, I mean. Trust the plan. Yeah, the many things to say here. Number one, Whitney, thinking back to when Michael Krieger and I were on your podcast, like this is why I'm extremely mm -hmm. happy that you guys wrote this piece, particularly hiding, uh, highlighting fluent in US Plus. 
Because I think whether it's Tether or more specifically USDC, if you recall the conversation mm-hmm. that you, Michael, and I had last year, I was pretty convinced that like USDC was going to be like the private public partnership company of choice. But they to- they said that, right? Like who was it? It was like Brian Armstrong of Coinbase was like mm-hmm. USDC yeah, is going to be the de facto of the US. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Well, oh, right. Mm-hmm. It seems like whether it's R3, Fluent, the combination of the two, just working behind the scenes. Like, again, I thought R3 was done. Like, I thought they just completely missed their product market fit and were defunct. And that's leading me to believe that, like, the tethers and USDCs of the world, which get all the, the tick. R3 from, this from year won CBDC Partner of the Year. <laughs> And from the C- central banking magazine, like but, they're but, all over the place. They're building comes, this stuff and no one is paying attention to them at all. But when and it comes and to they're the, the big banks of the world. So, you know, people being like, oh, this is all central banks and all Augustine Carsons. Well, like, obviously they're involved to a huge degree, but don't think Wall Street's out there like just going to let the BIS take away their like fractional reserve crack from them. It's, it's not how this works, you know? <laughs> yeah, but everything's based on framing, right? And that's why, again, I'm extremely happy you guys wrote this piece because I think over the last few years, particularly like the mainstream media and people covering stable coins and CBDCs have really tried to fit the frame around USDC and Tether. And I, I don't think mm-hmm. most people are aware of US plus fluent or the fact that R3 was not defunct until a couple of weeks right. ago. Right. Well, you know, we I think Tether's recent overtures. Oh, sorry. I, well, I, I think Tether's recent overtures to like, you know, onboarding the Secret Service and the FBI and all of this stuff, freezing all of these wallets on behalf of the US government. This is them trying to curry favor so they don't get totally nuked by regulations and they can be like a de facto synthetic CBDC. And I'm sure USDC is looking to do the same, you know, and that's why I, I, I mentioned earlier, like, what were these SBF political donations potentially really about to be like, who, you know, the people that develop the regulations and, and enforce them are going to be the kingmakers of like which stable coins are the de facto CBDC or CBDCs, right? And, uh, you know, I think that's something to, to look for here. I mean, which one is it going to be? I mean, like like um, <clears throat> Mark brought up and talking to the, the Paxos guy saying like he didn't think like Tether and USDC was going to make it past regulation. Like obviously, in my opinion, that's what SBF and Chalopin thought because, you know, F- FTX, Dell Tech, very tied up with Tether for a very long time like very connected. So why are they moving from one dollar peg stable coin to another? Well, the big difference between Tether and US Plus is that US Plus like overemphasizes regulation and CBDC compatibility and trust and reserves and all of this stuff. It's a trusted Tether. It's a trustworthy Tether, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I wouldn't really say it's actually trustworthy because it's working with the same shady people Right. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, but but they want that public perception to be there. And obviously, I think the gambit was to sell that to regulators and be like, look, this city group backed uh, U.S. plus stable coin and whatever uh, is compliant and compatible with CBDCs. It can be used for trade cross border finance all over the world. And look. R3 in the UAE and they're going to be the bridge between BRICS and the Western countries and all this stuff. I mean, I'm sure those conversations have been had behind closed doors, you know? And then one thing I think we didn't mention really quick on why it's going to, the digital dollar is going to be this and not like a direct issue CBDC. Like if the, if the fed was going to do a direct issue CBDC, they're really behind, like that would take them multiple years to roll out and they need this stuff a lot sooner. Yeah. So as uh, CIA spooks, literal CIA veterans focused on this kind of stuff have said in publication in from think tanks like CSIS is like, we have to use the digital dollars that are already here. We can't make a CBDC. And what does that mean? It means like they're close to structural insolvency and systemic collapse. That, yeah, exactly. You know. Exactly. And that Because that's what worries me. Because we could talk about, we were talking about like fear and false flags in the future. And I, maybe I'm in a bubble and have some 
confirmation bias, but it does seem like the marginal re- return on utility of these fear tactics tactics has diminished. Like people are calling bullshit. Sure. With inflation, with inflation <laughs> rates, people are pissed. Uh, the border situation, people are like, what the hell is going on here? You have the mayor of New York being like, we got to stop this. You'd never thought. You yeah, totally. Well, life. 2024 that, is going to be chaotic and they've designed it to be chaotic, like, I think. But I think in that chaos, they'll, they're very likely to lose control. And I think they know it too. Like once they inject, whether intentionally or not, instability into the, all these systems, their hold on things becomes a lot uh, less strong than it arguably is now. Because for one thing, when things get really unstable, you're disrupting a lot of the convenience comfort factor that keeps people from like paying attention or doing anything about how things are. Well, that's right? what worries me. Yeah. The return on marginal utility of these fear tactics is falling. Like they're going to have to create something so goddamn scary. <laughs> Then, Why do you I, think there's this yeah. UFO shit that they keep like resurrecting and like all these like crazy things or, that like happen the simultaneously? They're going to throw them all at us and see which one sticks. And their problem is like, what happens if none of them stick? Which is what I hope for. That's, um, like, that's but I think I people are like psyoped out, dude. And also you have yeah. all this stuff with like chat GPT and deep fakes. Like no one knows what's real online anymore either. And like everything is just really fake. Yeah. yeah, but that's why I think you also see this big push of, uh, you know, the other side of the stablecoin spook uh, angle, which is like banking the unbanked and this altruistic, uh, you know, like human rights foundation sort of angle that's like, oh, look at how good Tether is. It's, you know, it's being used and, and people love it and, and all this stuff. And it's, uh, you know, that's, loves it too. <laughs> exactly. And, and you look at the people that are sort of, uh, you know, the, the other side, right? There's the, there's the fear angle and then there's the like, hey, let's let's kind of trick people into building these infrastructures and rooting for them. And you look at that, you know, there's almost no better examples of the, pu- the public private sector spook, uh, you know, smashing them like Jack Dorsey with the spy shop that he ran at Twitter for, you know, a decade and, and his integration with, with intelligence, you know, censoring stories. And then of course, Peter Thiel uh, with Palantir and like founders, uh, you know, his big fund, right? And both of them are two of the biggest supporters of Lightning Labs, Elizabeth Stark's outfit, which is literally building a protocol to add Tether and stable coins onto Bitcoin directly. Uh, and you have people kind of like Sailor sort of kind of coming out and manufacturing consent for this thing and doing this, you know, keynote at Pack Bitcoin, being like, don't be a martyr, don't fight the system. Stable coins on Lightning are going to bring you know, $10 trillion to Bitcoin and we're all, it's all going to pump our bags. And it's just like, guys, like, what the fuck are we doing? Like that? What? No, let's keep that shit way off of Bitcoin. Why would we ever do that? Um, and you know, you're, you're seeing that opposite push of the, there's the fear push, which I totally agree. I'm horrified Marty of, of what's going to come next, because I agree that the diminishing returns of the simulated fear, it's like the next thing is, I mean, nine 11 was insane. COVID was fucking insane what the fuck is next? Like, I don't even want to think about it. But then we have the other side of the, you know, again, the convenience, the carrot versus rather than the stick. And, you know, we have these people manufacturing consent for let's dollarize Bitcoin literally. I mean, I think that's Lightning Labs is like tarot asset, like, like line is let's Bitcoinize the dollar. And it's like, no, you're dollarizing Bitcoin. Like, I know what you're doing. A couple of things here. Freaks, if you're listening, don't get the carrot because you get the carrot at the end of the stick. You start eating it and then you get beat with the stick. It's not worth it. Uh, <laughs> it's not worth it. And then two, with tarot and like uh, stable coins on lightning. I think Matt O'Dell does a great job of like, I think from a technical architecture, it's doomed from the start because you're trying to totally create convenience parity with the tethers and USDCs of the world on top of this interoperable distributed protocol. You're just never going to be able to get the same UX or liquidity profile that you could with tether just holding treasuries in a bank and issuing stable coins and centrally issuing them. Um, so I think that's playing into our favor. And then Mark, I completely agree with you. Like, I don't think we need to dollarize Bitcoin at all. Like <laughs> I'm a true believer, like we should hyper Bitcoinize as quickly as possible. Dollar is literally in the early stages of hyperinflation. Like I think it's a complete yep. waste of time 
to try to dollar. And ironically, it. Tether, you know, it was it was created by Craig Sellers and you know this Brock Pierce, this like island boy group, whatever. I, Craig is is cool, but you know, not not really a big fan of of a lot of these folks. And uh, you know, it was uh, it was an Omni coin, Master coin thing. You know, it was on Bitcoin. You know, originally at, at the get go. And then, you know, obviously there was there was huge inefficiencies with that. So they moved on to, you know, Joe Lubin's Ethereum, basically, <laughs> uh, which the, you know, Howie Lutnick said in that when he was talking about how much he loves Tether, he's like, you know, hey, if we want to if we want them to freeze something on Tether, you know, we call Tether and they freeze it. If you want someone to freeze something on Ethereum, you call Joe Lubin. I mean, he literally said that. It's fucking hilarious. Um, and then he obviously said with Bitcoin, you can't do that, right? So there is this like state change. But yeah, Tether was, you know, a big part, you know, it was on Bitcoin at the beginning. And now we're, you know, kind of they're posturing it as this reinvention of this this new thing. That it's like, well, no, we did that 10 years ago or, you know, nine years ago or whatever. Yeah. yeah it all stinks. Yep. I really, I really <laughs> hope people are like psyoped out and like are mentally strong enough to I mean aren't people burn out of this stuff? I mean, I, I know I am. Well, I mean I write about it, so <clears throat> that's probably a factor. But honestly, it's just so insane. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at it like they're they're sloppy, they're lazy. Like you like Joe Biden's our fucking president, dude can't even <laughs> and it's becoming glaring. But I think I think that's on purpose, though. Like I said earlier, so like everything they're doing, they can write off his incompetence because the person who's the figurehead of the country is clearly incompetent. But like a yeah. lot of the stuff they're doing is not; it, it's deliberate and intentional. Totally, you know. Well, that's where I think I think with Joe Biden particularly, like they played too big of a hand where it's like you guys really put this asshole in front of us and you're gonna expect us to believe that he's well they didn't have anyone else i don't think anybody thinks because he was well yeah mm -hmm. i mean i think it was kind of like someone they had to put in just because of how the the dnc primary was playing out you know he like won what like south carolina and they were like all right we're running with joe you know and that was that yeah yeah (laughs) yep and the Trump stuff, I mean, you know, like, yeah, 2016 was fun. Like, I get it. You know, that, like, that, there were some great memes. It was fun you know? that he made fun of Marco Rubio and, like, Jeb Bush totally. on live TV. It was very cathartic. You know, he yes. a dog. <laughs> you know, she's ugly, Ted. You know, that's hilarious. Like, he was hilarious. Very, very funny. He locked the country down, printed trillions of dollars. He was a huge proponent of Operation Warp Speed. Um, I mean, Still just the, this idea of him draining the swamp is so ridiculous. Um, and obviously, I think the plan, it seems like, is to sort of have him come back, right, and sort of be this kind of like false, like, hey, we, you know, we took the country back. And it's like, but it's the same fucking swampy yeah, people. Exactly. Well, I think they need to do that because Trump space has the guns, right? And so how do right. you disarm the people with the guns without coming and taking them? You make them think right. that they won. And then right. they're complacent. And that's well, that, what I think they want to do. And that's, I don't have an answer to this, but I'm wholly convinced that there is no political solution to these problems. You're not going to vote your way out of this. You're not going to. No. No. Push through. no. And so, Whitney, I know we've talked a lot throughout the years about like, what can you do? Uh, make yourself individually robust, sovereign. <clears throat> sure. Plant your own food, know your neighbors. But I do think there's also like a social narrative aspect to this that we really need to get out there. It's like, these politicians are not going to save you. Like we need to fix this problem. That's why they're not. And if you keep trusting the politicians and trusting the system to fix itself, you're going to end up on your couch with like an Oculus Rift, Facebook VR thing on, or Apple <laughs> thing on your head, clunking around in, in the metaverse, like trying to earn like, you know, cryptocurrency for like your body heat, like that Microsoft patent and shit, <laughs> like running on a tread treadmill, like a literal hamster when you're like not on the sofa. Um, is that what humans are supposed to do? Is that what humanity is? No, it's not. Uh, what humans are supposed to do is like go out and build and create stuff. That's literally what humans are here to do. And so what humans should be doing is building alternative stuff to the model that they have, which is become like a human vegetable trapped in the metaverse or whatever, you know, Um, let's go out and build stuff in the real world and like get local and make like real things. And we don't have to like 
s say no to all the technology. We just have to divest from these crazy people that run the technology right now that they have us dependent on and just make alternatives to those that we can use, you know? And, that's and there's people that can do all that stuff. There's people that are doing that stuff. Um, but people have to start being active and this whole thing of like, well, I'm just going to sit here and live my life as I've been living it up to this point and not change anything. And I'm just going to, you know, go out in November and vote for one of these two guys that, I mean, no, you're going to end up in the pod. Sorry, dude. Even and and how embarrassing on this, on this trip, like how embarrassing has the Malay stuff been where it's like, oh yeah, this like ANCAP libertarian guy who, ran for president and it's like and he's he wants to dollarize the country bringing in outside financiers to to dollarize the country From new york to, so wall street for, yeah yeah he's got ex goldman sachs caputo as his fucking head of the central bank uh picked guy his vp literally was trained by the you know took courses uh you know with the cia in dc i mean it's just it's like embarrassing but he says Parasito, he has a chainsaw, he makes fun of blue-haired libtards. It's like, he does, the, it's the same Trump play, the Bolsonaro play, the same thing where it's like, he does the lexicon of the things that we want to hear. They ridicule because, the ruling class in the establishment yeah. and they ridicule people that like, you know, a large segment of the public does not like or is tired of. And then they gain trust and support. And then when they're in office, it's the same people that they put into power. So Javier Malay was railing against the establishment of Argentina. Uh, but right, so the outgoing president is Fernandez with, with Christina Kirchner as his VP. So the Kirchners right. were there. But right before them was Mauricio Macri, who was a disaster for Argentina also, a center right guy. Um, and Malay, uh, his economy minister, the head of his central bank and other people in his government are all from Macri's government. They're not like from outside the political establishment. They are the Argentinian political establishment. Um, and they're people from mainly JP Morgan and, and Deutsche Bank running his, you know, fiscal policies and all of this stuff. And those same people have the same designs that the IMF had for Argentina, which is to yep. uh, sell Argentina's state assets uh, to foreign companies, specifically in New York, which is exactly where Malay went first to seek out uh, financing for dollarization. So basically, uh, Malay has done what the IMF was hoping to do to Argentina faster, or at least that's how it's shaping mm -hmm. up. And he, you know, his first thing too was to devalue the peso by like what, like fifty, for like by like half, 52%. right? Mm -hmm. So that immediately, immediately just like worsens the economic situation for everyday Argentinians, you know. Uh, in terms of their purchasing power, it gets like cut in half like that. I mean, I get the whole thing about like the debt and all of that, but I don't um, like Argentina has a lot of issues. Yeah. But in terms of, and I've explained this on some past podcasts before, um, but if you look at why Argentina has those problems and how they developed and like why the central bank started printing all that money and like why their economy collapsed in 2001, the guy that basically engineered that economic collapse was put in charge of the economy again when the economy collapsed. And he had like a quasi dollarization plan that Malay's dollarization plan is based on. And this other guy, Domingo Cavallo mm -hmm. is his name, endorsed Malay and his dollarization plan. It's like the same crowd. And Malay looks different. I mean, it's not that different than Trump, right? Who in the early 90s was bailed out by Rothschild Inc. And then uh, puts Wilbur Ross in charge of the Department of Commerce, the Rothschild banker that bailed him out. Um, as like a, a big thank you and then like doesn't really i mean if you think about like trump's policies and stuff like when he was president like a lot of people have forgotten like what he actually did sort of like mark brought up like you know operation warp speed in the, in the lockdowns and all of this stuff right uh but he also had you know people like to say that trump is like anti-war and like anti-interventionist but uh, his national security advisor was john bolton guys Trump did that. <laughs> uh, who do you think yeah. we'll have this time? You know, um, it, it's it's problematic. And so, like, the idea that, like, we're <clears throat> just going to, you know, trust the plan and that these guys are going to help us when trust was uh, Trump was in for four years. Did he drain the swamp? No, um, he enabled the swamp. 
he'll do that again. And I think a lot of this stuff, this, you know, martyrdom of Trump in terms of like, oh, they're going to take him off the ballot in these states. I think that's uh, I think that's a psyop personally. I think they want Trump in because remember, they wanted Trump to be the nominee back in 2016. That was a deliberate policy that came out because of WikiLeaks. Like we know that. They right. like wanted Trump to be the Republican nominee, yeah, they're, and the, they're Democrats, the Democrats worked they, to make that happen. Yeah, in the within the Podesta leaks, which I highly recommend. Everyone always talks about how great Assange is in WikiLeaks is, but no one ever actually reads the fucking shit. Go through the Podesta leaks; it's fucking horrendously scary. But talk a lot about yeah, there there were Clinton staffer emails where they literally are like, "We want Trump." Yeah, you're exactly right. It's 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 no accident at all. Why would and we look again? at the, Right. And you look at the, you know, there's this, you know, the, the Soviet intelligence, pl- you know, play called Operation Trust that they ran, mm-hmm. uh, which is basically exactly the same playbook that they're running now with Trump. If you include, you know, it's I think it's pretty safe to say at this point, like the Q trope is is, is an intelligence operation, pretty much. I think that's relatively safe to say mm-hmm. um, this trust the plan. There's this guy who's going to take care of everything. This fucking false savior guy who's going to blah, blah, blah. And, and don't do anything about it. Don't, don't go after these bad people. We got exactly. the guy, he's in there. Just sit back, drink your double gulp, uh, watch your Netflix. It's going to be fine. Um, and now here we are. The swamp. Right. Just, yeah. I mean, Adrian, stop control. believing that. Think, was QA <laughs> on just a big psyop to get everybody away from Pizzagate because of the Podesta emails? A hundred, a thousand percent. A th- I was there when it all happened. That was, I mean, I've talked, with Whitney about this before, like that was the thing that really broke my brain was like going through the Podesta leaks and, and yeah, like 2016, 2015, I think end of 2015 into 2016. Um, and like, just, I knew something was just so wrong. Like you just, my intuition, right. was just something is disgusting here. And then I saw it be, you know, I saw 4chan be basically bombarded and it turned into this, I even think Pizzagate trope, a lot of that stuff, was a distraction away from the actual things that were in the Podesta emails and a lot of the stuff. And then by the time Q came out, it was just a total, you know, trust sessions, blah, blah, you know, it became this, you know, people are analyzing clock things and, you know, it was just, it became such a, a, a goose chase yeah. of a rabbit yeah. hole. Yeah. Take the it away. Model for Q, sorry. The model for QAnon was created a few years earlier by Cass Sunstein, who was an advisor to the Obama white house. He's married mm-hmm. to Samantha Powers, who's currently head of USAID, which is pretty much known these days to be like a CIA front. Yeah. Uh, and he's also like a top guy at the World Health Organization now and has been since COVID. He's all about getting people to like alter their behaviors. And he wrote this paper about how to disarm um, conspiracy movements from within. And instead of getting right. them to distrust the government, to trust the government, literally what QAnon right. did. And he wrote yep. the, the roadmap for it before. And to think that wouldn't have been followed, um, I, you know, think it's important. But also like the Podesta leak stuff, you know, I think also aspects of Pizzagate, there were people that were like put in there to like ridicule the whole idea that like there would be this type of like sexual behavior specifically um, from our political elites. And of course, this is a couple of years before the Epstein scandal breaks, for example. Right. And from that, we have, you know, uh, among many other things, what these emails between people like Jess Staley and Epstein mm-hmm. being like, what Disney princess do you want next? And all of this stuff, right? right? And right. like, there's stuff like that in the Podesta emails. Like, we can't mm-hmm. talk about that, apparently. But they mm-hmm. want to, like, ridiculize it. Uh, sort of like what happened with uh, the COVID vaccines, people who were critical of, like, why is the military in charge of this? Why is it being rushed? Why is it being forced on people? And then people being like, it's going to turn you into a 5G antenna at its 99% graphene oxide based on a study that didn't actually conclude that. Look, um, this magnet's next to my arm now. It's like, what? You, you fell for it. Yeah, but I, I mean, they totally. do this kind of stuff all the time, and it's to try and get reasonable people from looking into stuff and just to do what the term conspiracy theorist as a pejorative was designed to do, which is to yep. get the, the whole laughter response when you uh, criticize the government and say it's up to no good. Um, And honestly, there has to be a change in in tactic from those of us who want to reach people uh, with this stuff, because I think too many people, even in alternative media are willing to like buy into stuff when it comes out and gets viral without looking into it. And then they propagate it. Like people have to do a lot more. I think do do 
diligence and realize that like this is an info war i mean hillary clinton said that years ago and she's like we're losing the info war and all of this stuff <laughs> like Mm -hmm. They were then for sure. And they obviously yeah. invest a ton of money in not doing that. Do you know how many bots the U.S. government and specifically just like the military alone has to like shape narratives online on social media? Uh, and and think about direction. how ChatGPT has just like <laughs> boosted that kind of stuff. The whole plan yeah. is to not have anyone know what's real or fake anymore. And AI is, I mean, is being used for that. It's like overtly admitted to in this book that mm -hmm. Henry Kissinger and the, and, and the former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt wrote together. It's explicitly about that. And then having us be so dependent on AI technology, specifically generative AI, that we become cognitively diminished and we can't even write anymore. We can't communicate without AI. And then we can't perceive reality, what's real or not, without AI telling us. And that's this whole gambit here with like censorship um, going on right now that we're, you know, AI is going to be in charge, not just of saying, uh, deciding what content you can see, but it's also going to be producing the bulk of the content humans totally. won't be anymore. And that's already happening, guys. Um, so yeah. the best way to deal with that is to spend a lot more time in the real world talking to real people because like what you see on Twitter and all of this stuff is like more insane it's going to be more insane than it is now. Right now, it's more insane than it's ever been before. And that's only going to continue escalating because it's just going to, it's going to be nuts, you know? Yeah. And, and they're creating we have to focus crazy. on building other things, not focusing on yes. all these distractions and psyops that are constantly going to be online. And, you know, totally. another aspect of this, like, remember in 2016 when, like, Hillary Clinton, they, they were all saying it was, like, 99% chance she was going to win based off mm -hmm. of literal fake polling. They just like made it up Nate to Silver. try and demoralize yeah. Trump voters and not have them go vote. That same tactic they do to people all the time mm -hmm. to make us think that like we're alone and we're isolated and no one else sees this stuff to demoralize us. And Facebook specifically experimented with trying to manipulate news feeds to make people feel that way. It's like a matter of record as it was like 10 years ago. They still do yeah. that stuff all the time. Totally. So like, if you're, if you're not looking at, at social media as like a war zone, you need to, otherwise you are very susceptible to all of this stuff. And then you have, I mean, you know, P Peter Thiel being a huge part of that Trump Facebook manipulation, of course. Totally. And then, you know, you have, uh, you know, yeah, this Twitter file. Trump's transition team, basically. Exactly. So. And then so you mm -hmm. have him, you know, with his Rumble stuff, you know, buying out, you know, the, you know, the Glenn Greenwalds. And then you have Elon, you know, buying out Matt Taibbi and Barry Weiss and, and the whole Twitter file limited hangout bullshit. That was, you know, hey, where are the files? Like, release these things. Why didn't don't, we have a new system for doing this? It's you drop the files publicly. You don't get eight Google searches with Elon Musk over your shoulder, you know, going through the files and only able to write about that. So you have these incredibly popular uh, limited hangouts, uh, so that people that do, you know, don't trust the the modern narrative go towards these, uh, you know, lightning rods. They're forced down into these very controlled operations um, that are literally funded by, you know, Pierre uh, and, and Peter Thiel and, and these guys. And, and so you, you, the, it's all the counter narrative is exactly. It's funny how PayPal keeps coming up. It's so interesting. Um, and uh, you, you, the, the controlled narrative is, is, uh, or the counter narrative rather is just as controlled as the mainstream narrative. And indie media is just as controlled as mainstream media. It's just as clickbaity. It's just as fake and, and dumb uh, as, as mainstream media. And, and we're in this place now where it's like, <sighs> there's like, <laughs> four people that I like trust that I think good do good news coverage. And I'm talking to like two of them, you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's pretty miserable out there. Um, and I think people have to just be like way more uh, aware of, of just how kind of in, insane the, the control of the narrative really is. It's, it's yeah, critical thinking needs to make a comeback big time. Well, yeah. And that's why the Podesta yeah. emails, like anchoring back to that Pizzagate, I anchored to two things. The Podesta email is like, what the fuck is a pizza related handkerchief? What is walnut sauce? Never heard of those. Yeah. Two <laughs> 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 
<laughs> when James Alfonso's Instagram page, when it first dropped, like I went to it, took screenshots, like that shit was real. It was very creepy. Totally. Like, and it's the controlled narrative side of thing because as we've talked for most of this discussion, like with Bitcoin, like there's this controlled narrative coming to Bitcoin. I'm very happy. Number one, you guys wrote this piece. And number two, Mark, you said some things that you did earlier, like as Bitcoiners. And I do truly view Bitcoin as the most potent tool we have to get away from this. Like control the money. You can control the world. If we can take their control of money out of their hands by making Bitcoin succeed, we actually have a chance of getting away from this dystopian hellscape. But they're infiltrating and I th that's what i worry about like moving forward is like all right how do you preserve the the properties of bitcoin that make it worth actually using without it getting co-opted before that totally i mean that's the thing that's so crazy you know like there's the this whole narrative of you know it you know it empowers the the unbanked and all this stuff well it's like well it empowers the DOJ holding 200,000 Bitcoin just as much as it empowers, you know, the guy selling papooses on Bitcoin beach. Right. It's like, <laughs> uh, but times 200,000. Right. Uh, so there's like a lot of power and responsibility, I think as voices within this system that I think people have, we just, you know, I've kind of made it my mission of 2024 to just like, like, scorched earth it's like I, I i don't care about being kind of nice to these people anymore it's like i see what they're doing i see them infiltrate the conferences and the spaces the way that they write the things that they push the things that they manufacture consent for the things that they uh you know apologize for um and i think stable coins is the easy one to really look at because it's just like this is the dollar system. This is the military industrial complex. This is the DOJ. This is the CIA. This is the FBI. This is the US fucking government. Like, what are we doing? Why are we letting these people into our stable? You know, no pun intended. Why are we letting these wolves in? Um, you know, and, and, and there's so many ways that Bitcoin can monetize and succeed and actually make life way worse for the majority of humans on Earth. I think, you know, we'll probably you know, it be fine to some degree because we know how to consolidate UTXOs and coin control and, and you know, we self custody and, you know, we've been in it for years. So we're, we're like set up, but, you know, there's not that many Bitcoiners um, really. And if things monetize insanely here because of ETFs, because the regulatory mode's finished, all this stuff, it's like, okay, well, the DOJ makes billions and trillions, if tens of trillions of dollars and like the four of, the four people in the Bitcoin space that get it make, you know, a couple million, but that million is worth a hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars because everything's blown out anyway. And it's like, is the world really that much better of a place? Um, if like 8 billion people can't afford base layer transactions. So there's a lot of things that can kind of go wrong in the monetization of Bitcoin. Um, if not done right with like really good education and, um you know really like thoughtful articulate like the next steps the next year the next two years uh are just so important um you know for bitcoin and i think we need to understand the stakes but not be demoralized and know that it is still an open protocol it is still a system uh we can build whatever the fuck we want on it you know we can build you know torrent seeding incentive structures e-cash structures lightning fun stuff right well, I'm happy you said eCash because I, I think like stability pools and Chami and Mints is could totally. be a stable coin killer. A hundred percent. I agree. Or you could build a stable coin using eCash or using lightning channels, stable channels that don't touch treasuries at all. And you have, you know, we don't need the dollar system to exist, but we can have the idea of a stable unit of account. That's great. Let's do that. That sounds awesome. We can build that. People have already built it. Actually, it's pretty incredible. Uh, we don't need to buy treasuries. We don't need to continue on. The, you know, frankly, the U.S. government's the biggest terrorist organization in the world. I mean, they just are. So why are we saying that we're banking the unbanked and, and, and serving the global south by perpetuating the biggest terrorist organization in the world? No, it really is. It was poetic, too, when Elizabeth Warren and Jamie Dimon were powwowing on Capitol Hill talking about how crypto is used for terrorism. Powwowing. Mm -hmm. Three, three months after we paid a $75 million settlement fine with the Virgin <laughs> Islands for the Epstein stuff. And you mentioned Les Daly, who was the man behind uh, Jay, Jamie Dimon as well. 
Like, yeah. Yep. <laughs> JP Morgan was caught with like a ridiculous amount of cocaine on a boat that they ran. I mean, it's like they were trafficking on a container. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Like, give me a fucking break, you're this ethical bullshit. We know the majority of financial crime is done with the dollar. It's not even close. Bitcoin well, is to, to take this by back, stupid oh. criminals. Sorry. Well, to take Go this ahead. back to the whole thing of, like, Jamie Dimon programming your money and, like, not Jerome Powell, okay? Remember how Jamie Dimon a few months ago was like, well, we should just seize people's private property for, you know, climate change policy. Remember that? Like, private property doesn't exist to Jamie Dimon. If his friends at Goldman Sachs, who basically designed all this like crap that the UN is backing and green finance and blue finance for Mother Earth and whatever, you know, uh, if those projects decide that they want your property, uh, I guess they'll just turn off your money or whatever and take it. I mean, do you really want to give these guys total control? No. I don't, um, but they have big nope. plans. I mean, remember, Marty, I came on, I guess, probably a couple of years ago now, and we talked about natural asset corporations, how they're trying mm -hmm. to securitize the entire natural world, and now they're going to tokenize those securities, and whoa, the it's SDGs. going to be wild. Yeah. It's uh... SDGs is going to pump, like, the most insane, like, Wall Street casino the world has ever seen. No one talks about that stuff either. It just drives me crazy. Uh, but again, BRICS countries, Western countries, all on board for Agenda 2030, the people in charge of climate finance for the UN, Mike Bloomberg, the billionaire, and Mark Carney. I think your viewers know enough about Mark Carney to know why that's insane. And to think that Mark Carney and Jamie Dimon and Mike Bloomberg and Bill Gates and all of these guys just care so much about the planet and not about robbing you of all of your wealth, which is what they've spent their entire careers doing. I just, come on guys. We have this, we have to like watch what people do and like judge them by their actions. And like, not when they say stuff, like whether it's cloaked at humanitarian googly guck or it's Trump being like making fun of Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. And it's very cathartic. Yes. But like, look at what the guy does too, when he is in power. Right. Go. He'll do the same thing again, you know? I think, I think we've shilled this on one of our episodes in the past, but I'll never pass on shilling this. Go to be the Best Evidence YouTube channel and look up all so the good. and P-L-E-N-A-R-Y apostrophe S. All the Plenary's men. John Titus did a dissection the man. of the yeah. HSBC. Yeah, the Mexican drug cartel um, money laundering event with HSBC and Mark Carney's involvement in that is astonishing. Um, he doesn't care person. about the planet guys. What I mean, honestly, that? green finance is the <laughs> biggest grift in the world. It's like, at, because Where they literally now? are Where going to now? use and sell off the entire natural world for the grift. I mean, what and is he doing claim it's he was, environmentalism. He was, he was a finance minister of the UK. He did something in Canada. Oh, head he head of the bank. bank of England and the bank of Canada. So two central banks, yeah. what financial stability board, top guy at Goldman Sachs, um, yeah. friend of the environment, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's such a running trope. I mean, it, you, you saw it with, with Ghislaine Maxwell's like Terramar project and the yeah. citizens of the sea. And it's, it's digital identity and citizenship and, faux protection of the environment as a way to basically like traffic launder uh and and make tons of money for you know i mean it's it's uh it's a disgusting racket well speaking of i mean what we have racket. right now is them literally tokenizing all their existing rackets to move it into this new mm -hmm. like fourth industrial right. revolution paradigm that's literally what is happening across the board and people just like don't recognize it and they're cloaking it and all the stuff like uh, specifically with like sdgs and agenda 2030 it's like this will make a better world and then you actually like look at it and it's like this is insane why are all bankers in charge of this you know, like, <laughs> I mean, it's just not on the planet. You want the smartest people doing this. So. Smartest yeah, people. Um, if they're rich, like... they're smart. So. It is. Oh, man, I hate it so much. But I mean, you go back into like the UN, like the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, like at the end of the 90s was like, 
Yeah, so you know how we used to be at least viewed as like the public sector, you know, uh, all the public sectors of the world all coming together to like democratically vote on stuff. Well, now we've basically been taken over by corporations and now the business of the businesses of the world is our business. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. You know, I like to think it's, I mean, the UN's not your friend, guys. No, Um, it's the... There's so much I could say. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I could literally go on for hours and be like, here's an example of why you should never trust the bankers. And still there's going to be that handful of people with the hashtag Jerome Powell is my pal and Jamie Dimon is my knight in shining armor. And I, I don't, I, sometimes you just can't reach people, dude, you know? QE anon, you know? <laughs> okay, that was pretty good. That's what I really do think. <laughs> I, do not. I do think the, uh, I think the inflationary pressure that people are feeling in their everyday lives right now is like a catalyst that is going to push people towards our. Well, that's what I said earlier. If you there, they in order to create this space where they want to like push people into this new system, there's going to be chaos and there's going to be instability. And so the comfort and convenience that keeps people asleep will be disrupted. What people Mm -hmm. do in that point in time is the most critical about this whole thing, about how it plays out. Seriously, like that is the most important window. And again, that is why it's so important to be local because, okay, there's a big cyber tech on the financial system. The internet goes down for a couple of days. What are people going to do? They're going to go out in the street and look for answers, figure out what's going on. This is why it's important to know what's going on and couple that with having, you know, connections in your local community so you can direct people about what needs to be done and what's happening at that point in time. It's like very important. Yeah. And prep them for when the internet gets turned back on. Don't believe anything these people are telling you. (laughs) Well, also the internet, when it turns back on, isn't going to be like the internet now at all nope. they're going to put ai in charge of like literally all content your id is going to be tied to not just everything you post online uh, but everything you read and consume every site you visit and they plan to pass all of that through ai to determine if you're a threat to the system or not this is all like predictive policing all of this stuff is built into this system specifically in the us the Biden administration already has the policy framework developed they've had it since I mean, they first came in to power in 2021. It's funny. It, I was it, it's been there the, for the, two years. The prism and the muscular programs that, you know, were kind of, uh, you know, uh, exposed in the, the Snowden and Vault 7 and, you know, a lot of the, the, the WikiLeaks, uh, you know, we, we know directly that the U.S. government has access to, uh, you know, the, the profiles of whoever they want on Yahoo, on Google, you know, on, on Facebook, on these on these huge, uh, you know, private public sector blurriness. And then as well, I think specifically the interesting thing about the muscular program is that uh, not only do they, with PRISM, they can just ask basically without a subpoena, without a warrant, they can ask for information on, on user accounts. But with muscular, they were actually directly attaching themselves to the fiber optic lines of Yahoo servers and they were taking people's information directly, even though they had access where they could file paperwork and get anything they wanted directly from Yahoo, the US government was like, the you know, NSA and CIA were like, hey, let's do this project where actually we can just pull it directly from the fiber optic cables, and then there's less of a, of a paper trail. So, uh, you know, you start to look at, you know, who's actually controlling the infrastructure of the internet, and you're seeing a massive explosion of submarine optic cables that are owned by these these companies you know google owns or partially owns 8.5 percent of all submarine fiber optic lines in the entire world facebook just did one where they went all the way around africa um amazon is right behind google they have like just under i think it's like ninety thousand kilometers of cables microsoft has a ton and then of course you know then there's the starlink play and elon is a total you know darpa boy as well um subsidized by the government in so many ways and you know the infrastructure of the modern internet is is on a physical level very co-opted and as soon as they want to basically flip that switch they will lovely and you're not gonna uh, be able to do this Eric Schmidt, yeah. right, who basically runs like AI national security policy for the US uh, too, and is like funding all this science and technology policy stuff, basically 
key officials in that of the Biden administration are being paid, their salaries are being paid by Eric Schmidt. It's like super illegal and Politico reported on it and like nothing was done. They were like, well, I see you found out. And that is that. That guy has an insane amount of power. He was just on a podcast uh, talking about what needs to be done about misinformation. And he was saying, uh, yeah, uh, we need to uh, get everyone's ID tied to social media. And then when people post misinformation, report them to law enforcement. Oh, lovely. Remember how that guy posted stuff about how he hated Joe Biden uh, and how Joe Biden shouldn't come in his neighborhood and all this stuff uh, on Facebook. And then the FBI shot him in front of his house and he was like an old disabled guy. Yeah. The fat, yeah. Fat old guy. Eric mm. Schmidt's idea is a very bad idea. It's a very I mean, bad idea. Eric sure. Schmidt is also a dangerous fascist who controls a large amount of U.S. government policy right now and how the government mm -hmm. and the intelligence agencies and the military plan to use AI. And meanwhile, Larry Page has been missing for like six months and so no one knows where he is because the USBI <laughs> is uh, Hide to hiding from him. the subpoenas and the Epstein case. Yeah. And they, all these guys own islands. That, like Richard Branson with the with the sex cult, the uh, you know on, on his Necker Island, where I believe Sergey Brin was married and he was the best man. Larry Page has an island. I mean, all these guys. There's this huge island boy consortium of Google, you know, stable coins. And they love to bank with Jamie Dimon. Uh, it turns yep. out. Um, yeah. <laughs> yikes. That's interesting. Um, Do we need another Occupy Wall Street? I know you mentioned it. And he said they don't like, do you, yeah, do you dude, but it's, uh, I mean, they don't it. want that. They don't want that. And so what has to be done is people have to divest from Silicon Valley and wall street as much as possible. Um, because basically what I call the blob that basically runs the U S it's the national security state It's Silicon Valley and it's wall street. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's harder to divest from the U S government. If you're living in the U S than it is to divest from big tech and Wall Street. You can take your money out of JP Morgan and Wells Fargo and Citi, and you can stop using Google products, Microsoft products. You can uh, not use OpenAI maybe, which is basically Microsoft um, and all of this other stuff um, because they plan to do a lot of bad stuff with your data, like a lot of very bad things. Uh, here's an example that's uh, very black pilling. Sorry, everybody. Okay, so <laughs> what's going on right now in, in Israel, right? Uh, the IDF uses an AI algorithm called that they literally call the gospel. And they said the IDF officials have said that before the gospel, they identified 15, 20 targets to assassinate in Gaza a day. Now that they use the gospel, the AI algorithm identifies hundreds, right? And what are the metrics for identifying who gets to live and who dies? Well, they won't tell anybody. Uh, but a lot of the people that have been killed have been women and children. Was it because they liked a post that Hamas made on a social media network? Was it because their cousin is in Hamas? Was it because they went to a person's house who a, pers a relative of Hamas lives there? I mean, it's very broad, isn't it? Uh, no one really knows. So it's very likely that because of the surveillance dragnet that Israeli cybersecurity companies test out first in Palestine and then export around the world because that cybersecurity segment of Israel's economy is like a major part of their GDP and they test it out there, right? So Palestinians are some of the most surveilled data harvested people on the planet. That data Except is being fed into the gospel. 7th. Except so on October 7th. Yeah. That, it was down that yes. day. We're not sure what happened. <laughs> Yeah, just like oh, NORAD on 9-11 and all this stuff. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, I mean, so interesting. <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, yeah, and then they called it their 9-11. Um, you know, very interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, this data that's been harvested on Palestinians is now being used to decide which of them are blown up or not. Yeah. What happens when we get to that point? Do you well, know who runs the AI weapon stuff in the U.S. that's also being tested? Not just, I mean, Israel has their own, but the U.S. has it too. It's being tested in Ukraine to decide who lives and, and dies. It's Peter Thiel. 
and Palmer Lucky, who created Oculus, which was sold to mm-hmm. Facebook because of Peter Thiel um, and all of this stuff. It's the same crowd. Peter Thiel runs Palantir that you harvest your data for intelligence agencies. Every intelligence agency in the US uses it and it profiles people and they can label you as subversive. And Palantir is the outgrowth of total information awareness that I mentioned earlier. Palantir was literally created to replace that. They did it Andrew, on purpose. Palmer Lucky's yeah. company, Andrew, too. Is Very insane. The it's framing. involved with the border stuff, too. Well, the they have this huge surveillance, money. autonomous dragnet on the border, Andrew set up. It's obviously not stopping people from coming in. Is it to stop people from coming out? Maybe. But I, I just finished writing it a works piece. both ways. I just finished writing a piece about uh, the, the basically the peer to peer revolution uh, in the late 90s with Napster. Uh, with Nutella, with E Donkey 2000, which was Jed McCaleb, the Mt. Gox Ripple Stellar guy. Um, and you look at actually, there was a huge amount of involvement of intelligence agencies in the founding of Napster uh, and of, of BitTorrent. And you see that the ISP usage, the percentage goes from being like well under, you know, 10% of, of you know, the internet usage being peer to peer networks to being over 60% by the time BitTorrent had really done its thing. Uh, and you cannot really have a surveillance state without being able basically to obfuscate data sending, packet sending from your devices to these centralized servers where they're doing this work. So you actually even look at the basically, you know, Napster was arguably a psyop to get us all to connect our computers and make the internet be this huge network of peer to peer stuff with huge amounts of data packet sending to set us up right before 9-11, right before the Patriot Act, right before, you know, all the things that were then later exposed basically in Vault 7. And you can kind of see this trend of, you know, I mean, it's literally Peter Thiel and and then these these same people uh, that were that were infiltrating, you know, the peer-to-peer networks that basically allowed for the obfuscation of the data surveillance market that we now have. Uh, yeah, it, it's very on stupid. that note, the big trend with data after 9-11, like intelligence agencies, you know, the uh, the narrative, right, was like failure of imagination and intelligence failure about why 9-11 happened, right? And so the solution that the intelligence agencies had ready made to this excuse uh, was that all, da- all the data of the national security community needs to be warehoused in one central spot and shared. Yeah, so and you had shared with me the letter from Larry Page, who wrote a New York Times op-ed like two months after uh, 9-11. No, like Larry Ellison. Sorry, Larry Ellison of Oracle, mm-hmm. which was a CIA project as CIA well, front. Project Oracle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he had come out and been like, you know, the way to avoid 9-11 the next time is to, yeah, exactly what you just said. Sorry, just wanted to. They want everyone's data. I mean, data has been a huge part of this play for a really long time. And now we're giving away more of our data than ever and more intimate parts of our data. And now they have tools that use that data that can do awful things if we let them. And it doesn't mean we have to live without AI or any of this stuff. Like if you want to use it, okay. But we have to divest from big tech AI because they are trying to use AI to turn us into a like giant underclass of subhumans who, I mean, this Kissinger Schmidt book is so crazy. And I encourage everyone to read it because they literally lay out that it's going to create neo-feudalism. They don't use that term. But basically, they say there will be two classes of people. There will be the people that program and maintain and set the objective functions of AI. And then there will be the people that AI acts upon who lose the ability to understand what AI is doing to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's neo-feudalism. But like for obviously, it's big tech and everyone else is essentially what that is. And the people who set the objective function, I'm sure, will be like existing oligarchs and existing power elites. Yeah. Well, once that system's in place, you're not going to break and get into the, the top tier. Like that's over, you know, and you'll the whole what they talk about is co- you'll be cognitively diminished. AI will act on you, will ma- manipulate you in ways you don't understand, and you won't be able to tell what's real and what's not. And that AI uh, well, first of all, AI hallucinates, like that's the term. It like will produce output that isn't even real and doesn't exist. And they argue in this book that 
AI will push us into this era of unseen realities and that only AI can see. And we should trust that those are real because AI is super smart. Yeah. And, and so they, AI, I mean, this is like matrix AI. level shit to an insane degree. It really truly is. So I had a good conversation oh. with Alex Fetsky last month and like the whole narrative around AI right now, particularly why they're trying to create these regulatory moats is this concept of AGI, artificial general intelligence. It's a can, It's yeah, it's a complete red herring to just yeah. funnel people mm-hmm. into these closed source mm-hmm. AI systems where you can control the propaganda. A bit of a white pill here. It's yeah. good to see yeah, open source. I'm, totally. Open source it, AI. It is a bit of a white pill. Yeah. <laughs> there is this. Well, here's the white pill. Open source AI models are reaching parity with opening eyes and uh, mid journeys of the world, which is good. Yeah. I mean, right, if so you there's... are against the world coin model and you're using open AI and like pumping Altman's bags and making him more powerful, like, please stop, dude. I will. I'm, I'm <laughs> just... using it. I've been experimenting with it just to like see how it works, but yeah, that's what our strategy in 2024, we're transitioning all to open source models. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason they've been so successful. It's because they've made us so dependent on specifically big tech tech. And Mm -hmm. it's very hard to drop that like that, especially when you have like Mm -hmm. businesses to consider that are like so entrenched with that a lot of the time. But if you are a company that wants to stand for freedom and specifically financial freedom, you must move away you must have a plan to move away because I mean, what's happening. I mean, take Microsoft as an example, which basically is open AI at this point. Um, They've basically said, okay, you have a windows system. Your data on there is tied to your Microsoft account. If you lose access to your Microsoft account or we block you from your Microsoft account, you lose all of your data on your own computer. And at the same time, you have no right to say no to them uploading all of the data, all of your data on your computer to feed their AI, which presumably will include open AI. So your data is not even your data anymore with Microsoft. Yeah. Why are you using Microsoft products? And, and that's where the, I think the removal of, you know, it, it really, the onus is on us to, you know, stop feeding these things. There was a, uh, you know, a 2006 paper uh, by Assange called Conspiracy as Governance that kind of is basically the white paper for WikiLeaks. And he talks about the need for us as citizens to increase the cost of the conspiracy against us. And I think in regards to AI, you know, the way that we do that is we stop feeding them the data that they need to, you know, if we, if we feed them bullshit data, uh, it gives them more shit to process, more things to parse. The, the thing that AI really does for them in the panopticon that we're in is it helps them parse through all of mm-hmm. the survey data really, really quickly. So if we are really like careful with what data that we feed them, you know, AI is a, is a great tool for them for decreasing the cost of their conspiracy of of, great, of general surveillance. They don't need to, you know, hire, uh, you know, a thousand people to parse through all of our chats. They can just have one thing search for oh, shit, these guys said Hamas sleeper cells, boom. And then they, you know, now they're looking at all their things. They flag them. So, you know, it's really important for us to not, uh, you know, expose our data by using and agreeing to these user agreements where we let, you know, like what Whitney just said, you know. Using Microsoft products means all of your data on your Microsoft product is theirs. And that feeds their AI. Without that data, this AI is completely useless. So we need to increase the cost of the conspiracy against us. Uh, very like carefully and and, and, uh, and that that's really how we do it is limiting our exposure to their systems and then you know hey maybe if we want to set up a bunch of uh, APIs that feed a bunch of bullshit data into uh, you know Sammy Altman's uh, thing sure let's go do that but that's not like something that everybody can do that's not like a practical thing for you know for like my parents or a day to day you know user of the internet but understanding that you know you data is the most liquid commodity in the world and there's huge speculative markets for data there's huge data brokers that sell you know billions of people's data uh for pennies on the dollar to these companies that you know there's so much stuff in data brokers it gets so crazy and i think ai and data and surveillance have a huge sort of uh they're odd bedfellows uh, and we have to just be really careful about what we feed into it uh, and what we let out uh, incidentally 
because again, convenience is the easiest way to leak all of this stuff. It's, you know, you use Facebook. I mean, that's what Facebook really was. It was like, how do we get everybody to tag their faces, tag where they are, say what they're doing, you know? Um, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think it's, uh, it's exceptionally important for us to understand that our data is, is feeding these products and make it worse for everyone else. You know, it is sort of a, it's a team sport, uh, much like privacy on Bitcoin, right? It's like, if you do good privacy tactics, it makes everyone's privacy better. It's kind of the same thing with how we deal with AI and these learning language models and these data harvesting techniques. It's like the better we are, the harder it is for everyone else to triangulate because that's how data markets really work. It's triangulation. Yeah. The, um, I'm very bullish on the open source models that really get away, especially when you add like the lightning network paywalls. Cause that's a big problem for people. That's what open AI does very easily. It's like you pay a monthly fee, you get access, you just do this thing. Whereas if you were to set up an open source model, like you'd have to run it, you have to get like a, a cloud server or whatever, a cloud GPU, host it and then use it, host it locally to some extent. But where the lightning network comes in and makes it very easy for people to do all that hosting, you just pay a Lightning Network paywall. Um, you don't have your identity attached to that at all. And again, they're reaching parity with the chat GBTs of the world, which is good. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the most important thing here is divest from big tech, specifically like the big four, the ones that are contractors with the national security state and have essentially fused with the national security state. So like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Oracle, like all the big ones, Facebook, like all the big ones that are like obvious, have like obvious documentable intelligence connections from their beginnings to now, you know, like those are the ones to avoid that we should not definitely not be using. And I think also on um, something that needs to happen is that like supporting that kind of stuff and saying like, oh, we shouldn't divest, like don't be a martyr and don't fight the system, whether it's like for Bitcoin or like big tech or whatever, like that needs to become culturally unpopular for people who actually care about like individual freedom and protecting it, you know? Yeah. yeah. Like that stuff should be called out for what it is, whether the, the people saying it like know it or not, then give them the opportunity to be educated about it, you know? But if, you know, there's a lot of infiltration going on right now to get people to acquiesce to this kind of stuff or saying it's inevitable or saying it will be good for you or you little guy will become part of the privileged class. Yeah. You know, that's all fake and that's not what's going to happen. It's just to get you to be complacent and not to do anything about what they're doing. Yeah. And so if, you're looking, if you're looking for like an open AI chat GBT alternative, a Bitcoiner, actually just released a company called unleashed.chat that uses specific specifically open source models so that you can avoid chat gbt and that's the thing like i think i think these guys are going to lose cuz um, the open source models are beginning to outpace them in terms of quality I, I definitely hope they lose. But the other thing here that's also highlighted in this Kissinger Schmidt book is like if people become dependent on AI, it doesn't really matter if it's open source or not. People then become what they talk about in their book, cognitively diminished. The, the whole idea, it doesn't even, I mean, it existed before AI. If you don't use it, you lose it. Like any type of skill, right? So like most of us, right, were, I don't know, in college 10 years ago. Like, do you remember everything you took then? specifically the stuff you haven't used since, like probably not. Like that is a real thing that happens with the human brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like mm -hmm. if you become, you know, if you use ChatGPT for a few things and like certain cases, okay. But like if you're using it for everything to the point where like you don't, you've gone a year without actually writing your own article and you're like a journalist or something and you're using ChatGPT to generate it all for you, you're going to go to try and write without GPT and you're going to find it really hard. Like that's what Kissinger and Schmidt are talking about. And that's what they want to happen. And, and, and not just in the case of chat GPT in terms of like the algorithms, like dictating your preferences, right? Things like that, you know, or, or dictating like where you go and what you do, like the suggestion stuff, like by algorithms and all of that, like you won't even be able to, 
make basic decisions based on your own mm-hmm. preferences anymore. Like that's what they're talking about. So like all this stuff with AI is a slippery slope. Obviously open source is better than big tech, but people also have to like engage with this technology responsibility uh, responsibly um, because these guys are very aware uh, and we should be aware too that it can have very negative impacts on human cognition and we need our critical thinking skills to get through this and to yes. build alternatives. So let's keep them, please. You know, and I think it's very nice, obvious, but not that nice. You know, I think it's very obvious this has already happened. I mean, just looking at what's happened in the last six months of consuming content. I mean, it's yeah, this, there's a homogenous <laughs> blob of clickbait bullshit that's just clearly been made by AI. It's on every media platform everywhere. I mean, you just see it uh, and it's horrible. And, you know, I think there's an opportunity for people to look for real content, you know, look for people that are actually writing stuff doesn't necessarily have to be like long form or like the stuff you do with me or whatever, but like, you know, th- there's, there's a serious need and there's a huge vacuum um, because there's a big love affair going on right now with like predictive generated content. Uh, and I think it's very obvious as a consumer of content that it's really messed up the, the market for yeah. journalism and for content. It's just become uh, this. It's a huge problem, group. honestly, in independent media because AI is already yeah. like, cause a lot of damage for independent media even before chat gpt was here because people that like grew a platform and then instead of becoming motivated about like getting the truth out or like spreading the word about a particular issue they become like a slave to the metrics to the click right. count to the view count and all of that stuff and, and playing the algorithms and sel oh. and stuff to get to the top and so oh, what, yeah. what happens then is everyone's trying to do the same content, not the same content necessarily, but trying to play the algorithms game and placate the algorithm to get to the top. And so a lot that creates a lot of like, you know, hom- a homogenizing effect among a lot of independent media and in terms of like titling and like clickbait and all of that stuff. Like if it wasn't for the algorithm and all of that, that would not have happened. You know what I mean? And I think mm-hmm. that's kind of harm journalism <laughs> uh, to, be, to be quite honest. Um, but yeah, well, I'd be very I've never cared about SEO, but I know other people can't do that. <laughs> well, I'd be very interested because we've, I mean, I've been using this stuff in an attempt to, in a very particular way. It's okay. Way, a lot of, to- a lot of people do, you know, if you're trying to like run a news website and you're one person and you want to put out yeah, like, exactly. I don't know, five or six stories a day, like I get it. You know what I mean? But like, there's, you know, situations where it, it's just people being like, this is so convenient. I'm going to use it. What I'm talking about is like, I'm not saying like, don't engage with it at all. I'm saying like, use it responsibly and be aware it can have this impact on you. This, if you don't use it, you lose it stuff. You don't want to lose it because they want you to lose it because then you're easy to control because you like lose your, your cognitive faculties. And that's what they're trying to herd people towards. Yeah. Like at Bitcoin Magazine, we write in the print mag, like AI free, because we don't use any AI at all. That's like a choice that we made deliberately. But on .com, we use AI to generate images for certain things that we don't have images for. But we don't, we're not like writing stuff. You know, it's like there's, there are lines that I understand that, you know, for a media company that when people make those choices, I totally understand. But I also, there's a reason why the print mag doesn't touch any of that stuff and proudly demonstrates it, puts it as a thing on there that says we don't do this because it's part of what actually sets us apart and, uh, you know, hopefully will give us some lasting power, right? Yeah, and I've been so the way I've been experimenting with it for like the last three or four weeks is I agree with everything you just said. Like, if you don't use it, you lose it and the hallucinations. But I found a tool that really, so like, what I'm trying to do is curate like content that I think is good that people should like get access to. And it's usually audio and video content. And those content producers don't write articles about it. And so, what I do mm-hmm. is I take their YouTube video or their podcast. Then I put it through a transcription uh, service and then I point right now chat GBT, but I've reckon I've honed in on an open source AI that I'm going to use to do this going forward Mm -hmm. is you point chat GBT at it and you say, all right, right here, give it a prompt, like write me a summary of this transcription of this audio file in the form of an article. 
um, and it doesn't hallucinate. Like you can only write about that specific transcription. So we'll run this episode through it and it will only be able to give us information about what was said in that transcription. And I attribute the original content creator, put a link to the original content. Um, and then the article is written by staff. So it's somewhat obvious that it's not like a human writing it. Um, right. And try to make it like this is AI content, but it's all in an effort to curate what I deem to be high signal content and then help those original content creators like get attribution, like, like it's sort of weaponizing the SEO game, giving them backlinks so that their stuff begins to bubble up mm. and all that. And it's uh no, it's weird. Cause it is, it's new. We've been experimenting with it. I think it's a value add, but I can see like I haven't written in three weeks because I've been trying to get the process down for this. I'm going to start writing every day again, but it's like, uh, it's like, how do you fight back in this world? to try to get the good content out there. Well, I mean, the thing is, you know, everyone, I'm like a voluntarian, uh, like into voluntarianism, you know, like just like, I don't want to tell anyone what to do, you know, but people should think about the stuff and be very aware of the risks and make informed decisions. And I think prioritize keeping their critical thinking ability, you know? Yes. So like, definitely don't threaten that, you know, and do as much as you can to divest from big tech. I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what to do, Marty. If you think it's useful and a value add, very cool, you know, but um, people need to be aware of the risk. So a, a lot of stuff, like when I focus on AI, specifically stuff like where hallucination, AI hallucinations come into play. I mean, they're trying to put AI in charge of like major decisions, not just like who lives and who dies, uh, but stuff like facial recognition. And like in the UK, there was like, sort of a mini scandal because like the Met police were using like these live uh, facial recognition algorithms and they were like super inaccurate um, and like flagging people to like pull out of crowds and stuff. But it was like insanely inaccurate. And also there's been a long problem recognized for a long time that a lot of these AI um, facial recognition uh, algorithms like used by law enforcement are super like racially biased, for example, right? Um, um, among other issues. And they like in the UK, like just didn't want to change it. They're like, yeah, we know it's inaccurate. So what? I mean, what is that really about then? Well, um, I forget his first name, but there's this famous like philosopher, Foucault, uh, who, you know, wrote about like, you know, control and the panopticon and all of this stuff. He's like a big inspiration for the Palantir guys. Like when the New York mm -hmm. Times had this big spread about Palantir, they like posed under Foucault's portrait and stuff. The idea of like his panopticon is like, you know, just the the feeling that you're being watched by the state will make you behave. You know, it's not about like the AI being accurate necessarily it's about like everyone knowing they're being watched and they could be plucked out of that crowd at a moment's notice and to get in line you know that's the kind of stuff they're trying to create so like in my opinion that ai cannot be fed and cannot be supported and it's the big tech companies making that ai ai starve them of your data or feed them garbage data if you have the capability to do that you know mm -hmm. like those should be opposed a hundred percent you know, and the problem is here with like open AI, you know, that's Microsoft. Microsoft is so in bed with all of this stuff, dude. I mean, come on, it's Bill Gates's company. It was super compromised by Epstein in the nineties. No one wants to talk about that. That's why they lie and say that Bill Gates and Epstein didn't meet until 2011 when he was no longer like running stuff at Microsoft, even though there's news articles in mainstream media saying in 2001 that Epstein made a bunch of mon his money in the nineties from Bill Gates oh, but they didn't meet ten, until 10 years later. It makes no sense, right? So like their covering for Microsoft has been so compromised and tied up with intelligence for years and years and years, not good for anybody. And they're basically uh, trying to get their new election software, election guard and ins installed all over the US. They're responsible for NewsGuard, part of this crazy censorship industrial complex. That's just totally insane. And all this other stuff. Um, like they're a lot more than just a big tech company. They're involved in a lot of very bad things and they're uh, a dominant market player. I mean, Windows is used by like, not everyone, but like a dominant amount of the world, right? I mean, yeah. same with Google, um, but we have to break into that. I mean, we have to make the choice to not support that. Like even if you're just the one person or you feel like you're one person doing that, like it's, 
it's an important decision to make and hopefully other people will make that decision. But like, I don't know. I look at, at sort of like a karmic angle. Like I don't want to feed that. I know it's bad. And if I continue to feed it just because of convenience, like that's not going to be good for me long-term. I mean, that's how I feel about it personally. I mean, obviously people may not look at it that same way. Yeah. But again, I mean, those same people that end up relying on this stuff and big tech stuff, big tech products are being designed to herd you into this world as outlined by Kissinger and Schmidt. Yeah. So no, I completely agree. stop using it, you know, um, and they're putting the stuff in charge of, you know, who goes to prison, who stays free, who lives and who dies. Uh, who gets visited by the, you know, vaccine people and who doesn't, I mean, whatever. I mean, it, it, it's, it's all there. Like the biosecurity agenda is still definitely like a thing going on, even if it's like kind of on the back burner now. I mean, there's all this crazy stuff happening and it, they need AI for all of it, just in terms of like scalability, you know, they want to put like an insane amount of people under their thumb and they're a small group of people like we've talked about. And they're losing, they're hemorrhaging trust and have been for years. Yeah. So they need it. How People need to really think about how to fight against this and understand what the risks are. And it, it starts off with individual and personal responsibility. And it starts off with building alternatives and being local and unplugging occasionally and doing real stuff. Completely agree. And totally on that I have note, to run to the restroom so badly. I'm so sorry. I got to run. I'll be right back. All right. No, and that's the, uh, this whole open AI thing. I've been using it for like three weeks and I'm just like, all right, can I do like a minimum viable product? Does this work? And it does seem to work. And I've, again, identified, and I've said this publicly too, that's our goal in 2024 is to go completely open source, do it in a very narrow fashion, trying to highlight other people's content that is signal to get it to people. Um, well, like, then, you know, yeah. I used to work for like a news company that used Google docs, but then complained about Google censoring them. <laughs> and it's like, why are you still using Google docs? Well, because Google business suite is convenient. We've been using it for, it's great. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know. I mean, there's alternative to Google docs. There's like CritPad and like other things like that out there that like value privacy and aren't like training their generative AIs off of like studying how you write in Google docs, yeah. you know? So like people need to make this decision because if you're feeding AI, it's going to be weaponized against you. They're already weaponizing it against you. Do you want it to know exactly everything like about you and how you think and how you write and like all of this stuff? I think that's a very bad idea. Yeah, no, I completely agree. That's why I don't feed it any of that stuff. I'm just like, all right. Yeah, this yeah. Article, this small article. Um, ah, it's fascinating because it is weird. We're at this inflection point. Where things are changing so fast like on the financial side on the tech side yeah side. i think it's going to keep accelerating too i mean especially when things get really crazy i mean the internet may go off and i mean as soon as they're like oh you need a digital id to get online like i'm not going to be online anymore like i'm not doing that like this is the time for people to like decide what their red lines are and like how they're going to set up things and set up their lives to avoid having to renege on those red lines yeah you know like I am never going to do digital ID. I'm never going to do CBDC or synthetic CBDC or any of this shit that we've been talking about. I'm not going to do it. Right. So how do I set up my life? So I don't have to engage with those systems when they're launched and made like involuntary, you know, mm. I mean, that's the, this is the time to think about all that stuff. So why I think we need like another Occupy Wall Street. I mean, I think Occupy Wall Street was completely cocked to miss the point, but like something like that where people hit the streets and for like actually. <laughs> well, I think they want people to hit the streets. I think it's all about building stuff. They hate that. They want you to use their tools. They don't want you to make right. your own. We have to make our own, you know, and it's not just like tools like tech tools. It's like just building community building or building a homestead or like just building anything. They want you on your butt glued to a screen uh, and uh, doing nothing, trust the plan, whatever. And, and using all these technologies that are super convenient and being fed to us all the time, instead of going out and doing what humans do, which is to create and build. And if we stop creating and building, same deal, you use it, you lose it. People, humanity will lose the ability to even remember how to create and build. You know, I mean, imagine like kids born like 
30 years from now, if these guys win and they're just going to be like bombarded with like some like TikTok shit from the time they're like born on, their brain isn't going to know how to create anything. They're just going to be used to being bombarded constantly by like all this generated content. Like they're not going to be like humans are now. They're not going to know how to build and create anything. This is like an existential thing. Like what are humans, what are humans and what did they, what is humanity? I mean, they're trying to answer those questions for us and lead us to an answer that is not what humans are. Humans are creative beings and we build things, you know, and they've hijacked our society and are trying to build their thing to control everyone. And we have, if we don't want to live in that system, we have to build something else. And they want to create it so that only this upper privileged class, very small class, will be capable of building and everyone else will lose that ability and will be a giant underclass that they can do whatever they want to. That's not how this is supposed to be. Yeah. And so we have to not give away those abilities to these guys. We have to do stuff. It's really that simple. And, you know, I know people get like black pilled by this stuff all the time, but like building stuff is fun. <laughs> Creating stuff is fun. You know, I mean, it's very, it, the, the way you get black pilled about this stuff is by doing exactly what they want to do, you uh, want you to do, which is get depressed and get demoralized and stay on your screen and sit on your ass all day and be miserable. <clears throat> and that's them winning. That's them winning. And I would say it's not just building stuff. It's building sustainable stuff, which I know is a naughty word and it's been totally co-opted by, you know, terrible people, but it's, it's, it's building sustainable architecture with incentive structures that feed it. Right. It's not just about, uh, creating, you know, little or separate walled gardens that once the, uh, people that created it lose interest or pass on or, or whatever, it falls apart. It's like, you need to create alternative communities and structures, uh, that have built in game theoretical incentive structures that will perpetuate it long past, you know, the, the creators being around, you know, I mean, that's what Bitcoin is, right? Uh, it's an incentive structure above anything else that, you know, you could argue triggers some of this altruistic stuff to work for the benefit of the network, but really it's a, it's a, it's a selfish incentive structure that allows you to, you know, to, to buy back your time and be able to feed into it. And I think we need to kind of learn to build architecture that increase the cost of the conspiracy of against, you know, the human race <laughs> by these people. Uh, and then also creates like a sustainable alternative architecture that, uh, you know, promotes creativity and promotes having fun building stuff and, and all these things, you know, it's like, it's not just about going out and building. It's like, well, how do we build stuff that's going to last that can survive the internet going down, that can survive the coming onslaught of psyops that are here. Yeah. And it's not like even like everyone has to get out and make all the things, you know, no. just, I mean, some people have to, I mean, it's not like yeah. we have to convince everyone on the planet to stand against them with us. Like it, it doesn't take everybody. It just takes enough, you know? No, that and that's true. why it's like mm -hmm. a very small minority of people to really affect this type of change. So it's big changes always comes downstream from a small majority, a small minority of people. I mean, it's always that this is the, the Pareto efficient, you know, effect basically is the, you know, the 20% affecting the 80%. Uh, it's always a small group of people. And you see, you know, you know, like, again, not to mention Assange again, but it's like you get one person that kind of stood up and built a, 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 a sort of system. And now you have all these, you know, acolytes that are everywhere around the world that see what he did and, and now can build alternative architecture <laughs> that can maybe build WikiLeaks better than what WikiLeaks was and can actually sustain the seeding of these things and keep these things going. And by standing up once, you know, you create hopefully five people that see you stand up and then that, that, that sort of trickles, that trickles away because people can really tell there's, there's a, there's a bank run on trust, you know, uh, and, and people can really see when, uh, things are, are really fake. And when things are true, it resonates like crazy. Um, you know, I think that's why you guys get like such good numbers and stuff of the work that you guys do, because it's like actually real in a world of fucking shit. Right. So more of that, more of, uh, of that encouragement from via doing, uh, not just talking about it, but the actual actions, right. We need to really like internalize and externalize 
all the stuff that we talk about and, and actually put it in. You know, the revolution is a very inward, small, local thing. It's not this huge, massive thing. It's yes, we can use the internet to teach people the skills, but it's like learn to 3D print, learn to hold Bitcoin, learn to grow food, learn to do all this stuff and then go do it and fuck off and throw your phones in the river and like stop feeding all this shit, right? It's like the revolution happens when that happens. Right now it's important mm -hmm. that we teach and that those skills and those that tech is disseminated. But once it's disseminated- And like use the existing internet right. to learn that stuff, why it's still here. Right. You know, cause it won't, it. that kind of info and knowledge, they will take off when they bring it back. It's Absolutely. not going to have the same content it has now when it comes back. I guarantee it. No. Yeah. We need a offline library. of Start Amazon. storing stuff oh, offline on hard exactly. drives that you will want or skills you want to learn, eBooks about it, video rips about it, whatever. Start storing yeah. that stuff. You know, it, well, it won't for be us, there. Yeah. The Cubans exist and they've been running these like USB packet, uh, data packets for a while. <laughs> They're like in Peru too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like all over. <laughs> They're the pretty Cubans like ingenious. Be. Like, I don't know. I mean, I know like global South, like a lot of these banking, the unbanked guys like have a, I, I think have a very like negative view about like people in the global South. But as someone who like lives in the global South, people are like very resourceful and creative here and like do a lot of stuff with very little compared to the U S mm -hmm. and have a lot of skills that people in the U S have lost in terms of like you, um, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of stuff. Like, I mean, if you think about like in the U S like, Okay, so my great grandma knew how to knit, but I had to learn how to knit from YouTube. My grandma and mom never learned. My grandma uh, worked and didn't cook and made like TV dinners. My mom did the same. I had to learn how to cook myself. Like where I live in, uh, you know, in, in Chile, like people have a lot of skills that people in the US have kind of, it's just been generationally like phased out because people like just don't, know how to produce their own stuff anymore or like stuff they need anymore. I've lived in California for like 12 years and it's like, these people don't fucking know how to do anything. <laughs> it's like, absolutely. They go from <laughs> middle school to high school to college to Google campus and they walk in packs of 30 people. They all have their backpacks on. They get every meal cooked for them. They deliver their, uh, everything that they buy is delivered. They get their laundry done by somebody. I mean, it's like, it's, I mean, I worked in service for this whole time and I served all these people and it's like the things that I, I would go see, I would watch Tinder dates happen and see people meet each other and talk about, you know, and it's just, I, I just saw like creatures of the algorithm and, and complete loss of, of all of these skills that Whitney's talking about, just like everywhere you know and i know it's fun to shit on california it's so easy but it's like it really is like it's it's scary the uh the atrophy that really is so fight against the atrophy and fight against the apathy a hundred percent that needs to happen um on that Flipping. note i probably have to go uh do some kid stuff here in a second um but i got like five five minutes if you want to sort of like wrap it up if that's cool. Or at least I can pop I mean, out. I mean, we've been on for two and a half hours. Yeah. I've well, got, I think I've it's been great, though. Too. Covered got, a load of stuff. Very cool. It's been awesome. And before we wrap up, I'm going to give a shout out to the War Mode guys. The guys, uh, Billy and Spade, who run the War Mode podcast for letting me use their studio in Philly for the holidays. Really good podcast. You go check it out. Whitney, I think... Uh, It'd be, they'd be a good, uh, good show to go on as well. I think they're all right, right, <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. That would be fucking hilarious. I would love that. I'd watch that. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't know show. you're a morbid um, fan, but it's uh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm a huge comedy fan, uh, and uh, yeah, I think I saw them. They were on a, an early Ma uh, MSSP like a really long time ago, um, and uh, yeah, just catch them on that. They're pretty funny. Yeah. I grew up in New England. I know a lot of Philly people. Um, I used to play a lot of shows. I was in a band and used to play a lot in like New York and Philly and Western Mass and all that. So I have a pretty big Philly crew. So I know some of them guys. Hell yeah. Philly's uh, Philly's all right. Uh, yeah. For I was born and raised. 
but uh, right. yeah, you covered a lot. Uh, stable coins are going to be CBDCs. Don't use the stable coins. Protect Bitcoin because uh, they're trying to co-opt it right it's now. A, it's under co-opt attack, uh-huh. yeah. definitely. The co-opt attack is here. Don't let the sailors of the world be like, just let it happen. Don't fight back. Don't be a martyr. <laughs> That's the thing. That's like, a bad, again, like bad framing. It's like the framing isn't like you go along with it or you're a martyr. There's like a whole nother third right. option. Like you, totally. just def- you win. Um, you got to have that winner's mentality. We're going to win. It's not yeah. a cocky. It's not a cocky assertion to win. You have to believe that you can win. It's a confidence builder. We can do this. No, but we will win because literally these people are insane. They're insane. (laughs) And they're like actually idiots. The problem is like everyone else is like too distracted and too complacent and letting this cognitive diminishment thing take place and letting it happen to them. If there is a change there, it's like, they have major problems. They have major problems. I mean, think of the psyops they have to throw at us now. I mean, did you see that thing with like a couple months ago, like the whole alien thing? And they have like these like stone things in Mexican Congress being, I mean, that it literally looked like E.T. Like from the movie and like all the stuff. Yeah. And like, it was like paper mache. <laughs> I mean, like, stop, well, dude. I mean, these are the people live. that are taking over everything and we're letting them do it. It just doesn't make it. No. And then like the guy that invented CBDCs is like a failed reggae artist, uh, like in co-founds fluent finance, make it stop, make it stop. They're sending their best and their best are, are not that good. No, like, <laughs> They're not. The aliens, have you seen Tucker going on the podcast circuit? And he's like, I've got the alien information. I don't even think they're aliens. I think they're like demonic beings. So he's like being very vague about it. Like they've been with us forever. The Vatican knows. The government knows. <laughs> oh my God! No, Ooh, I ha- yeah. I have I have not uh, followed Tucker, whose father was in charge of U.S. propaganda a- operations, and who went to visit Nicaragua during Iran Contra Contra for Contra propaganda operations, and uh, you know has had a very interesting career trajectory. I'll just leave it at that. Um, be very careful about who you trust. Peter Thiel's What's Rumble, that? right? He just yeah, joined Thiel's well, Rumble, no. Well, yeah, a lot of people are at Rumble. Um, that's true. <laughs> but again, you know, I think there is a big effort to co-opt. Just like, you know, co-opting Bitcoin, big effort to co-opt alternative media. Um, and a big part of that is people offering money to people on alternative media. And the Peter Thiel circuit, Thielverse, uh, definitely does that. And they do it to a significant degree. And they publicly posture as being libertarian. Peter Thiel uh, goes uh, to Bitcoin conferences and calls himself a Bitcoin maximalist. And then later he goes on stage with the then CIA director and says it's a financial weapon from China to destroy the U.S. dollar and uh, U.S. military power. Okay. Um, That was within like a three month span. hmm, It was very rapid. Yes. So um, again, uh, don't just buy what these people say, watch what they do. Peter Thiel, if he's a libertarian, literally gave the worst part of the state the most powerful tool to eliminate individual freedom ever in Palantir. What kind of libertarian does that? Yeah, but he sold it um, for dollars, so he's just a capitalist, dude. You know? Oh, right. <laughs> that em- empowers the state along the way. Right. Now, Libertarian. Now he's funding their drones with Andrew. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. I know we all got to go. Mark, Whitney, number one, thank you for coming on. Thank you for writing the piece. If you guys haven't read it, we'll link to it in the show notes. Go read it. The plan to roll out the stable coins and the CBDC. Who's involved? Yeah. If you want to know how the CBDC is going to be in the U.S., this is the piece to read for sure. Yeah. Hopefully more people will build off of this because there's a lot happening in this deposit token stable coin space uh, and it needs more coverage and more light shown on it uh, because as things stands now, there's going to be this 
uh, dumb thing, basically, like this false victory psyop of, uh, oh, yeah, no CBDC for the U.S. We believe in financial freedom. All is well here. Uh, but the same programmability, surveillability will be in the synthetic CBDC. It's not a real victory. Um, so people need to be aware of what they actually plan to do, you know. Uh, and it's very clear. They've made it very clear. Just no one's paying attention. So I would really encourage other content creators watching to start looking at this very seriously and start talking about it a lot more. Because thinking that it's just the BIS is is very mistaken. It's not just the BIS. And the U.S. has very different plans. Totally. And, and if you want a nice little summation to catch you up, I wrote a book called The Bitcoin Dollar. came out of Bitcoin Magazine last year. Uh, or rather this year, I guess it's not 2024 yet. And uh, it's a nice little summation of the history of interest rates, dollar system, treasuries, how they work, and how they are trying to dollarize Bitcoin. So, you know, it's kind of a broad stroke look at the mechanisms, whereas, of course, you know, this piece uh, with Whitney is much more like the specifics of like, hey, this guy, this person, this reggae artist, this spook, whatever. Um, Reggae so, uh, yeah, check out, <laughs> check out the book on dollar if you, if you want a little speed run uh, on, on how this is happening as well. Yeah. We're going to win. Instill that confidence in yourself. Even if you're not a content creator, speak out against this. If you are a content creator, you should definitely speak out against this. Like This is an existential threat to the future of freedom for all of humanity that is mm -hmm. probably going to out over the rest of this decade so the the time is nigh <laughs> it is time to get on this shit. time to think so. about this stuff and start doing stuff about it yeah, yeah. all right we'll end it there peace and love freaks Kiki.